Hard work, work. Hard work. That's what they say. Hard work, work. Hard work. I earn my pay. Hard work, work. Hard work. Do it every day. Welcome once again to another work ethic podcast. And uh, this is a long anticipated episode that I've been looking forward to doing uh, with my brother, Nathan Bond, who is an artist and an educator. Um, and this is a brother that I met actually um, through the kind of V friends community. I met him. There's a conference called VCon and I met him. We stayed, I think in the same hotel, which meant we sat at the same bar in the bottom of the hotel um, where we actually just connected um, happened to be at this same conference and connected there. And we've stayed in touch seen each other at the uh, V cons have gotten to know each other over the years. And uh, anyway, Nathan is a, actually a brilliant artist, like fine artist, uh, and also an instructor does drawing, um, oil painting, his work's been displayed all over the world, right? London, Japan, Spain, all over the United States, um, as well. He's got some incredible work. I'm sure we'll get into all the different, um, facets of stuff that he's been working on, but Nathan, dude, I'm so glad we're finally doing this. Why don't I just hand it over to you? Let you kind of properly introduce yourself to everyone and then we'll just go. Awesome. Yeah. It's great to, I remember when we first met the first few days we were hanging out, you were telling me about this podcast and <clears throat> I've listened to it a bunch of times and uh, I'm super thrilled to, to be on here and talking with you. And you're right. I, I remember vividly, actually, you were sitting, it was during the day before the event started and you were sitting at the corner and I heard you talking about where something was. We're trying to figure it out. And you were talking to um, Will. Oh, Will. Thank yeah. you. And and I knew the answer, so I just kind of hollered across the, to you. I was like, oh, it's yeah, it's right up the street <laughs> down, down that way. Just go out that door and go up. And you're like, oh, thanks. And that was that was it. And then just fast friends right and after then that. I remember. Let me see if I can remember this. Now you're triggering. This is great. This is a great way to start. And then I said, That brother's got his fingernails painted. <laughs> and I think I asked you about it. And then we ended up start talking. And then we seen you down there again. What, what was that about? Yep. My daughter, uh, so we Ever since she was little, we started. I so I used to braid her hair all the time. I was I'm a super involved dad, and always was, and um, mostly started braiding hair, and then you know doing makeup and painting her nails, and she'd want to paint my nails, and I loved it. And it was a way we bonded. And we when she was really little, we did it on the regular, like every mm -hmm. couple of days, you know. And she was awful to start with, so you know, <laughs> all down my hands and, and stuff. And I would, you know, trying to keep her from grabbing stuff when hers were painted and still wet. Um, she actually still, until like a couple of years ago, would do this afterwards because mm -hmm. she thought that actually made it dry faster. Is that not I, true? Because I've definitely no, seen people not. do that. <laughs> but I, but I told her she had to do that when she was little. Just to keep her, her busy? Just to keep her from touching stuff. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> it worked. Because nail polish is not fun to get off of your furniture. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became, uh, you know, as she got older... Uh, so she's 14 now. So she was, you know, 12 when uh, we met. Yeah. 11. No, yeah. This is the summertime. Um, and, you know, they get busier and we didn't do it as often, but we had this standing kind of unspoken rule that anytime that I leave to go away for a few days, mm. we paint each other's nails. That's and awesome. so we are connected that way. So anytime I looked, I love it because anytime I look down at my hands and my hands are painted, I think of her immediately. It's great. And it's also... For me, as you know, I'm a fairly uh, traditionally masculine looking guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not small. I'm six four, so I, I present this, I think, uh, paradox to people usually when they see brightly colored, like pink and rainbow colors on my. It face. did. It did seem like a juxtaposition for sure. Yeah, and I don't. I I don't mind that at all. It's like awesome. I'm comfortable yeah. with that, comfortable in my skin, and I don't really care what people think or how they're going to interpret it. But I also like that it makes people challenge their views of how they're thinking about other things. And um, and then they oftentimes it's a great conversation starter. It is. Like I asked you about it. And you're like, now let me tell you about my family and like fatherhood. Yeah. And it's like, oh, now we're in it. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. really is. A very meaningful. <laughs> I, I love talking about my daughter. So, you know, it's, it's a great, great thing for me to get to open up about. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what the nails are about. Well, she still does it to this go day. Ahead, so. Sorry. She still does it. Anytime I go to conferences, and so you have them. You have them. I noticed they're not painted right now. They're not painted. Yep, you're home, home and yeah, <laughs> all good. 
Um, so why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your, um, just like at a, at a more like uh, professional kind of uh, intro of you and your work. And then I want to kind of navigate through some. Uh, oh yeah. It's uh, so, so like just went right down the rabbit hole there. Sorry. All good. All good. Uh, yeah. So I'm a, I'm an artist. I think first and foremost, you know, dad, I would put for before artist now, uh, but still a creative endeavor in my, my mm -hmm. mind. Um, I always wanted to be an artist. I mean, never made a decision, had no idea people made decisions until I was in college. Um, and just have been the driving force in my life has been creativity and art um, and whatever facet that's been able to take shape. Now, you know, as an artist, and I think most artists know this, you don't get to be a success and live off of your art <laughs> sometimes ever, um, but definitely not right away. Usually there are the rare cases, of course, but um, so I've done a, a lot, a lot of jobs in between graduating from, I went to Rhode Island School of Design. I studied illustration and painting, um, graduated long ago. I'm 50 now. So graduated in 95 from RISD um, and did a lot of manual jobs to, so, and we'll get into this more, but to basically buy back my time to be able to create and paint. And finally ended up moving to New York City in spring of 2001 and uh was very fortunate to land an interview in 2002 uh at parsons school design um and luckily i had i'd worked all through college but one of the jobs i did have uh because i had about four or five jobs uh was i was a ta so i ta'd a total of uh, 15 classes by the time i graduated so i started taing when i was a sophomore mm. so a there's not usually tas be they're usually up, uh, graduate students. So I was super fortunate to have that, but I had a lot of experience. So yep. interview was six hours long. Interview. The interview was six hours long. So there was like, you had to bring your portfolio. And so there's lots of back and forth. There were other people sitting there who had taught a lot more and uh, ended up getting the job offered. And I ended up, I taught there for 16 years. Uh, absolutely loved the job uh, teaching and getting to talk about art and share the creative process uh, and be able to help people unlock their potential is such fulfilling work. Um, and uh, I retired from teaching about five years ago now, let's say. Um, and I've done a bunch of other things. <laughs> uh, but currently now, uh, you know, I got involved in Web3, um, partly for the just the contracting side of it. We can get more into NFTs later yep. on. Yep. Um, it's led me down a, a path to be able to start to realize one of the other dreams that I've had for a long time, which is to uh, have a children's book publishing company. Uh, so picture books. Um, and uh, so that's launching and we've got our, our first two books are being illustrated currently. They're going to come out uh, next, next uh, early next year. So around beginning of end of May, June, they should be out in people's hands. That's exciting. Yeah. So super thrilled about that. And you're not doing the illustrating. I'm not doing the illustrating. No, no, this is, so I'm, it's a step back from the, the, the actual art making for me Yep. to be able to change an industry that has not paid creators. Well, both authors and illustrators. So that is one of the big mission statements that we have. So it's called fair share publishing. Mm. Um, and everyone getting their fair share is the kind of, the ethos that we are work under. So, you know, we're not functioning by greed or profit. So, and we're using technology in a way that's never been used before in the publishing industry. It's very old. It's dominated by five major companies. And it's something that uh, has not had a lot of invention placed into its framework because they make money the way it's going and there's no need to change it. Um, artists and authors for the vast majority, now there are exceptions, of course, but for the vast majority, don't make a, a lot of money off it. And it's very hard to make a living. And there's there's some real reasons, you know, outside of the publishing industry's, you know, hands, but it's also a lot of greed. They make billions, billions of dollars a year. Uh, and uh, artists have a really hard time uh, making a living mm -hmm. off of it. So we give 50% uh, of the net uh, to the creators. And typically, which ends up being about, you know, um, 35% off retail, but it varies quite a bit depending on how you're doing the math. So, and typically uh, it's a seven to 15% is the standard off of retail. Wow. 
So we're doubling what the high end of it would be. That's amazing. Now you said you're using a technology that's never been used before. Is that go? Tell me about that. Yeah. So we're, we're leveraging a lot of different technologies that have advanced and kind of came to a point uh, about a year, two years ago now that all of the friction points I identified in the publishing industry for children's books were be able to be solved by leveraging these different technologies and putting them all together at the same time. So it's sort of like, I think about, you know, if you have a laser beam, you know, and it's focused on one section, but it's not going to solve the other sections. But if you converge all the laser beams, it can solve them all, but it really had to have all the pieces and uh, blockchain was one of those pieces and NFTs is one of those pieces. So that was what allowed me to actually, you know, it's this started my, my realization. This was possible was at VCon where mm -hmm. we met at first okay. week. There was an author there who was talking about publishing and trying to use NFTs and trying to figure out how to do it. And the, the, the partial interest that his publisher had, uh, how challenging it was. He had a massive following. You know, he had, uh, I think, an a email list of 50,000. And when he sent out, part of his speech, he sent out an, e an email talking about he's going to NFT his book. Basically, we get to have an NFT of one of the quotes that he pulled out. Yep. He got uh, something like 13 responses. Because wow. <laughs> no one was interested. No one had any idea what it was. And, but it made me start thinking that there's got to be a way. The, the flexibility and the possibility of NFTs and blockchain technology are so revolutionary that it, it's actually enables anyone with an idea, if they can find a good dev and think through how to do it and apply it, they can solve a lot of problems that are burdened by friction points of, um, middlemen of uh, verification of authenticity of the need for transparency which is one in the publishing industry that's super necessary uh, and has been very problematic um, so you, you you take all these powers that the blockchain and nfts have and if you can think about it hard enough and long enough and figure out and you have a specific problem you want to solve there's a way to solve it i think for anything and it's accessible enough that you don't have to be a massive corporation to be able to do it. There are so many people that are starting and building in the space that want to help and want to see where it goes. And it's evolving so fast that you can get in there as someone with not a lot of capital to pay a lot of people, be collaborative, be open-minded. Uh, and you can really devise something that makes great change. And I think that that's really hard in almost any industry in the we'll say the you know the IRL world the real world yep there's so much hurdles that are out there in the real world and costs and you know and i i think it will come <laughs> yep later on but at this early stage is very possible to do a lot of really amazing things uh with amazing people so as I think about that email that went out to so many people and so few responses, um, part of my mind, and even as we're talking about this, like as you're saying all of this, I'm like, as somebody familiar with NFTs and familiar with blockchain technology, uh, it's all very obvious to me how this is such a, a disruptive technology that um, opens up so many of these possibilities that you're talking about. For those people that are listening, because part of the reason I, I wonder about that email and go, man, I, part of the reason I would think like people don't respond or even here as people are listening going, okay, wait a minute. I don't know what we're talking about. Um, can you do like a quick like 101 for those listening? Like like what is this technology we're talking about? And and then maybe maybe that'll help connect back to some of these possibilities. And we don't need to go a deep dive into how all these things are technically possible. Um, but may, and, and, and by the way, for those listening, I, so I have a handful of NFTs and one of my favorites is actually, um, some artwork that was done by Nathan. And maybe as you explain this, you could talk a little bit about a former project that you've done. Um, one of which that I have and, and really love, but like it, it, it most of these have been utilized or people are familiar with these as art, like artists have been using these, but like knowing there is something like the contract, piece of it on the backside can you give like a like what are we talking about 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that that's I, I am so immersed all the time. I, I do forget. So that's a great point. Is that it's alien to most people. It's is a it's it's an industry that unfortunately has a lot of vocabulary gating, like a lot of tech. That's true. That's uh, true. So when you there's a whole lingo that goes along with it. Never mind just the technical terms that go with it. So you know, once we can get past the vocabulary gating, I think we'll have a better chance for people to kind of get in there. So anytime I talk about it, I try not to use a lot of the industry terminology. So start, but for to start with an NFT just means non-fungible token. Yep. And really it is just a digital receipt that points you to a specific record. So if you think about it, like a treasure map though, that it tells you where the treasure is buried. Now, the best thing to do with your treasure map is not to carry it around on you and not just have be a one piece. You tear it up and you give it to a hundred different people all have little pieces of it. And so every single time you want to see where it is, you have the key that's hidden in a hundred different spots that you only can access if all hundred people agree that you have the receipt that points to it and will show you the map again. And so that is one of the mm. things about NFTs that make it secure. And so security is one of the reasons that major industries are getting into it is that you have to be verified by consensus. Mm -hmm. It's not just one person. So someone can't come along and hack a hundred people and never mind that it's a hundred different people all the time and it changes all the time. Yep. And they're called nodes that are verifying it. So it's an open system and it's called an open ledger system. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you had a bookkeeper doing your books for your company, if they make one mistake, that's, you know, you find out later on during your tax audit. You're like, <laughs> damn it. Yeah. Cindy, you messed up the ledger. You've got a hundred people all doing the same work separately. And if they all have the same answers and there's no one that deviates, there's consensus. And then you get the piece to your map. You get to see the whole map. Now that map can point to anything. And that's the great thing. That, NFT is just a directional that points to something else. And it has with it, and this is where you get a lot of the really interesting parts of capacity out of it, is it has a contract attached to it, but not a contract that anyone has to read or decide to do. It is executed by computer. So when it's accessed and you want to use that, it follows a set of parameters and rules and no one gets to say otherwise it's done. And that's the smart contract. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that actually got me into it. Me too. To start with was the capacity for artists to be able to sell their artwork and have that as the sales receipt that then you can prove that you were, it was sold from you to this person and you can have rules put into the contract like royalties. Yep. I want to be able to make profit along with everyone else as my career trajectory increases. So as I get more famous, and my painting sell for more, traditionally, I will be the person that will make the least amount of money ever off of my artwork. That's true. You sell the painting and that's that, right? Yeah. And you're going to sell for the lowest then price. Then you become money. Monet or whatever. And it's like, yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so, but with the smart contracts, you can say that every time it gets sold again, mm -hmm. I get a royalty off of that. So I'm sharing in the growth and the profit of that. Yep. So the buyer has a vested interest in selling it for a profit but it also then makes the artists have a vested interest as well. That's impossible to track down and follow up in traditional contracts with art. That's right. So, but this way with an NFT, you don't ever have to do it. No one has to do any work. It's all, right? yeah. it's all automated and you have a digital wallet. So everyone's got a bank account and that is a digital wallet because you access it now primarily through your online banking or your mobile banking and all those account numbers is very similar to what is called your wallet mm -hmm. in the NFT space. And it's just an account. It's a digital account and you collect digital assets. So you can buy art online and they'll have, you know, when anytime you buy anything, it comes in a nice package and has wrapper. And I think this is one of the spaces that makes it very exciting for artists because any contract that you get, you get a piece of mail, uh, you get a, a flyer. It's, designed in some way. And the same thing is true for this visual NFT receipt that you have. There's art that goes with it. Mm. Now, sometimes it is just art that you're buying and it's digital art. Sometimes you can go with physical art, but it could go to the deed of a house. 
It could go to a contract for anything that you wanted to. It can be used in insurance. It can be used in the medical field. The possibilities are pretty limitless. Once we get past the fear and some of the friction points that exist with any new technology, functionality, the user interface is a little clunky still, but it's advancing it so is. quick. Yep. And I always think of it like this, you know, do you remember when you got a, the last time you got a paper airplane ticket? And when that transition happened, everyone just uses their phone, their QR yeah. code. Unless you're last minute, you get a swap, you know, you don't have paper tickets anymore. But no one really remembers that moment when that stopped being the case, when that switch happened. And we've become so comfortable with technology being the palm of our hands that that is switching over to NFT. So now ticketing is a really huge yeah. portion of NFT usage. It prevents scalping and fraud you have the ability to prove that it's yours so the verifiable an aspect of ownership is a really huge part of why nfts and blockchain technology are possible. so the conference that we met at was a was a token gated conference we were able that was our ticket for that conference was an nft yep that's right and it basically just you know the, the link to it was just a qr code just like you get on the plane it, yep pointed to the ledger system and everyone had to agree that you owned it. And so no one could go in and scalp that or hack that. Mm -hmm. And that, that level of security and authenticity and verification is why banks are starting to use it now. Uh, City Bank just said that they're going to switch over all of their uh, international monies to a, a token. And so token is a, another word for NFTs. So a lot of corporations are, are, reinventing the language around it because there yeah, has been and it should be right like it like, yeah, like yeah. and, and when, if you remember the early days of the internet you know it's like we were like okay it's https colon <laughs> backslash back www it's like the language changes with technologies to where we it becomes ubiquitous it becomes a natural language we probably won't be using acronyms like nft or or you know, even crypto, which is like already like a, a term that has almost become meaningless in the amount of things that it talks about. Um, but you're right. The the common language, the language will become more common as the technology becomes more commonly used and just familiar in a way. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's like we've seen this before uh, in so many different things that that just had like weird he he technical language that nobody understood. And it seemed like a some weird strange sorcery or something and um and then and then here we are today like i mean even the 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 call that we're having right now is like all like the internet's just where we live now it's just like we yeah. this is like the water that we swim in um where before we thought you know there was like i mean I, you still remember these like damn articles that said like it's a fad this is a passing fad there's no real world <laughs> use cases for this thing and and it and it is uh familiar to some of the comments being made now with this technology um that no that was really helpful i hope for those listening that kind of like okay this is like what this is now you're utilizing this technology uh for fair share publishing um is there any way that you is there a way to like connect the dots here or share a little bit about how that's being utilized yeah a little bit um and and part of it is going to happen now at the beginning and part of it's going to happen as some of the uh, technology gets a little bit further along, but okay. we're, we're laying the pave or the, we're paving the, we're laying the groundwork, laying the, the groundwork. There we go. Uh, to be Foundation. able to utilize it even more fully. So there are a couple of uh, friction points in the, the, the ecosystem of publishing. And okay. one of those is payments. There's a huge cost with royalty tracking. So there's a software that you can lease. Uh, it's mostly by like two companies and it's astronomically expensive, which makes it very hard for indie publishers to do it. Um, and the way that most books are sold uh, require a lot of very, very, require that level of, of technology to be able to track it because the royalties that are paid are coming in from all different places are being paid at different times and at different percentage rates. And so you need something that's going to take all that information and process it and give you the information that all also takes a lot of time. So creators, and I just use the term creators, but it's the authors sure. and illustrators 
um, typically have to wait six months to a year for a, a check. Like that's, they come on semi-annual to annual basis. Wow. And that's, you know, not entirely the fault of the publisher because they literally don't know how much money they have or how many books they will have sold. That's just the time it takes to settle the account basically. Yeah. So a lot of, so we'll backtrack a little bit and that when a book gets published and shipped out and then goes to the distributor, goes to a warehouse and then goes to the distributor and then gets sold to a bookstore, the bookstore makes an agreement with the publisher that they're going to buy, let's say a hundred books. Yep. And they're going to have six months to sell those hundred books at the end of the six months. If they've only sold 50, the publisher has to buy back 50 books and pay for the shipping back at and the look, original well, price at, at the price they sold them for. Wow. Plus, plus shipping both ways. Wow. So there's, there's a loss there. So they don't know until that contract is up, how much of that, those sales that they got to start with. So they've given the money for a hundred books, but they can't do anything with it because they don't know if they're really going to be able to have that money or if they're going to have to return 50% of it at the end of six months. It's, it's a really old system. It's a weird it's like not, consignment deal. Like it's like, this is yeah, totally is. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons they, they can't, they just literally can't. Fuck, right. for, the sales the aren't complete for that yeah. period of time. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, th that model makes it very hard for an artist to be able to, Hey, you have no idea. You have no insight into how many books are selling during that period either. Even if the publisher knows, you're not getting those numbers. So you're just hoping at six months when you get your statement and your royalty check that it's actually going to be something you can live on. So it's very hard to plan and make a living that way. Has that, sorry, this is very interesting to me as like an industry question. Is that uh, remain consistent or how has things like Amazon or online sales affected that model where there's not giant, I mean, there's still our bookstores granted, but like, like they're, you know, I used to hang at borders all the time and go sketch or whatever, right? I just yeah, sketch yeah. all the random people at borders. There is no borders anymore, right? There, those books are not there. Um, and and if I want to get a book that I normally would have gone there, I just order it, right? So, like, how is that? But is it still similar because they're sitting in a warehouse somewhere? Is it like a similar model then, or do you know how that's impacted those num the sales and tracking and all that? It is, it is similar. So they're, they're uh, besides print on demand, which is the KDP system with Amazon. So, and that's sort of a different animal. Um, but uh, yeah, Amazon is still basically the bookstore. So they're still buying X they're amount. holding them, yeah. Holding them. So, uh, and then they ship them out and that's prime, you know, is why it crushes that's everybody. True. That's true. They also, you know, Amazon, like with any large corporation, you know, is leverages their, their size to get better deals mm -hmm. and also better. Um, they're not a great retailer for the, for the creators or even for makes the sense. public. Makes sense. Right. Because they have in their contracts, the right to just lower the retail price by up to 15% without asking anybody. And you're getting paid on the retail price. Oh, they're not beholden to like the minimum advertised price or whatever. Yeah. And right. and they, they try and get as much wiggle room as they can so that they can just, because they, it's a number of games to them. They don't really yeah. care. Just move them. Yeah. So if they have that room to discount it hugely and make the price swing, they'll do it because their share is still the same. Mm. They're getting their same cut. They're getting their taste. <laughs> and the trickle down effect down to the creators, the people that actually make the content are the people that end up getting the least amount again off of their, their labor. Um, so I, I see it and always have is like, it's a labor issue. You yeah. know, la the laborers are not getting paid. And this is across pr pretty much every industry, especially in the United States. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, looking at, so going back to how this yep. ends up affecting the business model. So if you can use blockchain as part of your payment system and you, you can <clears throat> distribute funds a lot faster, but you have to get rid of that bookstore endpoint contract. And that's what we've done. And, that, and so a lot of 50% of sales are done online now for books because it's not a new product. People know what a book is. Right. And there's such good image quality 
and you can have digital, like we have, all our books will come out as digital flipping books. So you can get a real feel of what it looks like, the page layout before you buy it. You know, you won't be able to read the whole book as a, a, but you'll be able to read a lot of it. It sounds like a page turn. It has shadows that go with it. So it's, you know, people know what the product is. So we're not going to sell to any physical bookstores. And by doing that, we're able to control and have complete insight to where our money flow is. So we will pay our creators once a month. Interesting. And so they'll be able to have insight into it. Now, where it, we're laying the groundwork is, and the tie-up is a little bit in payment back in payment processing centers through the online transactions. So Stripe is probably the, the largest uh, back-end payment processor in the world. Yep. So when you charge something on a website, your credit card, you know, your Visa, your MasterCard, PayPal, whatever it is, that's being processed through Stripe 90% of the time that you're online. Uh, and they take a 3.2% cut yeah. off every trade, mm-hmm. right? So um, they are starting to be able to create multiple payouts on a single purchase. So you can designate one or two people to have a split paid directly to them. So you can do this on the, on the old school rails, not on this. I know you can do this with a blockchain contract, right? You can do the blockchain chart. Yeah. And so, but, we're, you, but we're, you're saying you could do this just on a Stripe payment now. It's coming. Okay. That's it's interesting. Coming. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, they have it, you can split it two ways. Um, and there are limitations and there's, you know, size and scale and sure. stuff like that. It's, it's a new feature this year. Splitting your 30 cents. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, so we're, but we're setting up and we're building our infrastructure to be able to have it that every time someone buys a book, the author gets paid, the illustrator gets paid and the publisher gets paid all at once. And then there's total visibility in that. We also want to be able to have it. And what part of it is, uh, our our business model that doesn't affect any of the buyers or the creators is we're able to start off as a small publisher and dream big and launch this because we're going to have um, we're referring to it as basically producers. Uh, anytime a film gets made, there's a bunch of people that pitch in, especially indie films, and they're producers, co-producers, yep. and they get to share in the profit of the the ticket sales. Yep. So for each of our books, we have a very small pool of producers and we've used blockchain and uh, some developers, we've built a proprietary walling system that allows Stripe when one of those two split payments to send the revenue, that's the percent that they get to share in into a, uh, I think it was sort of like a honeycomb wallet and everyone can go and access through their specific NFT, their specific honeycomb and take out their bit of honey whenever they want, where they can let it sit. But the wallet itself, the we have some great developers, uh, Full Stackery, uh, who you know, uh, yeah. we met with Natalie. Yeah, we met there as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You met her there. We yeah. all met at that little... I- bar I, it's 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 man it's, it's amazing what's oh, grown right. out of this little you sway yeah. go grab a drink in the hotel pub yeah, i tell you <laughs> yeah uh and so it's um it allows that to be split 40 different ways and everyone can see and track what it is because it's an open ledger one of the other brilliant things about the open ledger system is that everyone can see every transaction so not only do you have to be verified by a bunch of people, but everyone, you can go and see anyone's transaction anywhere. Now, not everyone's name is attached to it, but that yep. wallet that yep. your account number is. And so you can see what this account number has been doing. You can go and look it up. Yep. So if Gary V, if you knew his account number, even if his name wasn't attached to it, you can see everything Gary V is doing with that, that wallet, that account, if you wanted to. And right? a lot of us have. Yeah, and, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> and he's very open about that too. Yeah, it's like here it is. Like what? what? Yeah. It is. It's one of the magical things about it. Um, and so you know, for now to start off with, we're only using the blockchain and the, as the back end part of our our financial structure for funding. That's good. But, so then on the front end, like I'm a consumer, I don't need to have 
Ethereum to get a book or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Like you don't want right. to, that's a friction point. You don't want to have to deal with anytime soon. Yeah, not, not at all. We right. are doing things like, uh, you know, we're going to have QR codes on the book that attach to an NFT that proves you bought the first run. Nice. And it's just going to sit there. And then, you know, one day, whenever you're ready, if you're, if you're someone that is. Oh, I see. So you have like, we'll hold it for you, but you are the only one that can ever claim it. That's right. And when you're ready, cause this, eventually you will have a wallet or your yeah, baby's going to, your little, the kid yeah. you bought this for is going to have a wallet and they can come claim it. That's right. And they'll have proof that I have number one or oh, first, man. you know, books, first print editions. How do you put that sometimes? Well, you know, so if you start creating meaningful IP too, it's like I have the first Superman. I have the first, yeah, it's a it could be a very big deal. Yeah. Well, yeah. you just sold me for sure on the collectible <laughs> side. I'm like, I don't have a, a kid for a kid's book, but that that's an incredible feature for that. Yeah. It's you know, and you know the the IP and the idea of being able to do more with it has also led to the other parts of our book. So our books don't end with just the reading of that one book. So, you know, a books, so there we, and we only do children's picture books and we can talk about more about like why that is, but, um, and part of that is a business decision. Yeah. Uh, it's also where my passion is and, and my expertise is. Um, but if you're a parent and you've re- and you're reading a book for the 900th time to your kid, it gets rough. <laughs> I don't care how good the book is. The 900 type through, it is, man, I've fallen asleep. Like, yeah, yeah. you're not done. Wake up. It's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's hard. So I was thinking, well, what if every time you pick up the book or once a week you pick up the book, it has new content in it because everyone's sitting there with their phones. And so the oh, AI has really blown up in that, you now can access and have new content. You look at a picture, you can have a game pop up. So uh, I don't want to give away too much about our upcoming books, but you know, all of our books are going to be, have this extra life that goes beyond it where we're developing little games and interactivity or new Oh content man, that's so that good. Comes- books yeah because you could just i mean you're like and i'm guessing like something as simple as a qr code hidden in the picture yep. that goes, not, now i can or just off to the QR side code. or whatever it recognizes so now so the, it recognizes the image so you don't have to have a qr code you just really? our software just recognize you put hold your phone up oh because it's your images, images. like you could just be like yep. yeah we have, there's a few hundred images it needs to be able to recognize yep and it goes off and that's, that's, it's functions just like the QR code pulls up, whatever it is that wants to do can bring to life a character on the page that will maybe run around augmented reality yeah. with it. Oh my yeah. gosh, dude. That's we're so having augmented reality and we're building up metaverse. So we're taking all of our IP that's coming in with our characters and it's like a little uh, Disney world. If you think about it that way. So we have games and interactivity. You know, we know that kids are going to spend time online anyway but they also still love real books. So why not bring those two things together? And so we have uh, a metaverse that we've built out called Fairville. And you get to go in as an avatar. You don't have to have an account. You just get a little avatar and you get to go around and you get to interact with different things that we've built out within that space, including fostering creativity. So we have challenges for them to do their version of a character or to draw different things. They can submit the artwork to us and it goes and up on a wall in this metaverse that other friends can go and see. It gets put in a digital frame and it's hanging there on the wall. And if you are someone that's really interested in writing, you can write and illustrate your own little book and it will be, we'll publish it as a digital book that lives on a bookshelf there. Like in a library. Like in a library. So you can go to the bookshelf and you can pick up or somebody else can come and you can go. They can can go go pick up books that someone else contributed. Yeah. You can say, hey, my it, John, I go go to the Fairville, check out the book I wrote and illustrated. It's sitting there on the shelf. It's called this. Wow. And then you just go on your computer, drop in. You can go in the same time. And you can have live stream videos. So we're gonna have our, you know, our author talks and our illustrator talks streamed live into that space. You can watch the YouTube video content that we'll be creating in terms of how it's made, the illustrator's thoughts, all in there. So there's so many fascinating aspects to writing, creating a book that kids 
you know, love the children's books, but they don't know how they're made. And so I thought it'd be great to be able to kind of share that aspect, the behind the scenes all the time, and actually then foster that creativity of feeling like I, you know, my work doesn't just have to go up on my mom's dad's grandpa's refrigerator. Yeah. Right. It can go up in the metaverse. And actually, so the refrigerator is, is our little portal on the website. You go and there's a fridge drawing of a fridge and that's what you click on to jump into the meta space. I love it. So is this, how much of this, I mean, I know this is like under development and this stuff's coming out pretty soon with these first few books. Is this something like if someone's listening and we'll, we'll, we'll I want to get into some other things and there's, there's plenty of time, like at the end to kind of plug like a lot of places to find you. But right now, like this is interesting. And I know folks are going to be like, is there somewhere I can learn more about this? Is there, is there an existing yeah. website? Can you point people to something that they can like, is there something they could look at now? Yeah. Yeah. The, the website's up. Uh, the metaverse is, is built. It's just not the link to jump to. It's not live yet. We're still working out some of the kinks and putting some content in there like the fun little side game. So you can go and pick up a Game Boy within the meta space that then takes you to another kind of old school arcade game. So there's like nice layers <laughs> happening. Uh, it's fairsharepublishing.com. F-A-I-R. F-A-I-R. F-A-I-R share.com. Or publishing. Publishing.com. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And when are the first few books supposed to come out again? So the first two books are coming out end of May. Uh, definitely the first week of June, they'll be printed. So they're going to the printer. They'll start being able to look at them and do pre-orders uh, in probably April. Okay. Are you able to say anything about those first two projects yet? Um, I, I can say that there'll be something for it. There, there are two age groups. One's like early reader and one's middle reader. Okay. They're definitely geared towards uh, one of them is also the dads are going to love. Okay. <laughs> you everyone's want to get this for father's day for the dads that they know. I'll say that. Okay. But that's that, awesome. I, can't, I can't say anything else. All right. No, no, no. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Um, Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, God, dude, I'm so excited about this project. And I, and by the way, I'm Thanks, immediately Paul. like, I can't wait to, I have a million questions that are probably going to go too deep here. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll connect again later on. Um, I, as I think about these like books created around early childhood mm -hmm. and, and I know, and even as you're talking about these opportunities for education and creation and stuff, I think like, well, you know, you, and, and even as you talk about being a father, it's like, you seem to have a real, uh, you, you hold a real importance around this kind of early development piece as an educator, as a father, as a, as a creator in all of these ways. And so, uh, and I'm just curious, thinking back of your own childhood, um, you know, you've probably heard me ask others this question, but like, as you think about the, the the development of the concept of work creation mm -hmm. creativity however but like work as a concept took on shape in your own life like what are some of your earliest memories around this concept of work oh man you know you know all the questions to ask <laughs> i i think that a it is when we're we're little that the concept of work starts to take shape before long before you're like getting your first job for pay. Yeah. Like you're, you're learning what that is um, by observation. You're learning what it is by um, how you're treated around the, the work quote unquote that you do do um, you know, how well do you do the chores that you're being given mm -hmm. or, you know, the tasks that you're asked to do, or even, you know, your behavior, like, are, are you well behaved at school? You know, you've you've got a job as a little kid. It's to go and do home work. You mm. know that, that that word is instilled really, really early on. I think too early, to be honest. Um, or maybe it was just too early in the negative way for me. Okay. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of creatives um, are not the best academic students. Sometimes. That was sure that was my that was my experience. 
<laughs> da Vinci probably was, you know, but so it's, it's definitely. Yeah, not yeah, a, yeah, sure. There are the, the savant types. Yeah. Um, but you know, a, a creative mind tends to wander. Um, so I, I was not, uh, a diligent academic as a young kid. Um, I was average, you know, I was, I was Probably fortunate. Average. That I was, yeah. <laughs> I was fortunate that I was smart enough in some aspects. Like I had a good analytical mind for, for numbers and for, uh, just logical thinking, um, you know, so my father, my, and I should probably go and explain kind of like where this is coming from because my father does play a huge role in kind of my idea about work, um, work ethic. So my father's an economist, super brilliant guy. Um, and my mother is a social, was a social worker, was in social services at hospitals for most of her life, um, dealing mostly with outpatient rehabilitation. So, you know, people come in, they're all messed up. And she's dealing with helping them transition back into the world. So she's dealing with the families or their caretakers. And so a lot of emotional side and they were polar opposites in that. So my dad was uh, non-emotional. He does not have a good connection with emotions or a relationship to emotions. Uh, my mom has a plethora, <laughs> uh, probably a little too much. Um, in terms of uh, kind of the compassion arena or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of emotions that can be hard to control. Too. Yeah. So, uh, it's an odd, it was an odd pair. I'd say that. Hmm. Uh, and so my dad worked, he was a workaholic. He was gone a lot traveling. Um, we moved. So we moved around a lot growing up. Okay. New York was my, is my 13th city. Uh, I've now been here since 2001. So I've been here longer than anywhere else, but you know um, I, and that includes overseas uh, all, up and down the East coast and out West. So all, all for dad's work. Uh, mostly for my dad's work. Yeah. I continued the the habit a little bit after college. Um, but I think that was, uh, you know, sort of the norm for my generation after college. Real quick, help me out. So dad's an economist. Super. We traveled a lot for his work. Yeah. I'm realizing that I have so much of a blank in my mind of what that would even, what does an economist, like, what is he doing? Cause I'm like, uh, the best I have is like a professor. Like what, like where can you say more about that? And just, this is my own ignorance maybe, but I'm like, well, what's he doing? Um, there, there are some, uh, let's see what I can actually say here. There's some, uh, <laughs> there's some debate about all of that. Like, okay. I, I, fully about what dad was actually doing yeah yeah so we lived, we lived so i lived in this will this will hit tie in real quick uh i lived in leningrad and in moscow during the cold war in the late 70s and early 80s two different times wow. different periods we lived there um and my dad is a was a specialist on the soviet economy interesting so um he was uh so, so economists have different jobs. You know, he worked for different uh, economic forecasting groups, uh, okay. and then eventually the government. So yep. we moved to when we moved to D.C., he started working on the Senate, and then um, as an economist and advisor, you know, specializing. You know, during the Cold War, that was you know kind of in demand. Um, and then he became the uh, vice president of the Export Import Bank um wow. which uh, deals with um it's not the world bank world bank is the bank that makes loans to other countries yep the import, import bank is the bank that makes loans to other companies in other countries yep so there's a lot of analysis and and um due diligence and hurdles of like well is this are you giving money to a company that's going to uh adversely impact a, a US company and if so then you can't give that money and is this company, you know, what are they doing? And is it for the benefit of that country? So there's a portion of the United States government that grants loans to companies that they know are going to help stabilize the country by building a robust economy within that country. And so it's not always through giving money to the government. Sometimes it's through giving money and, and loans mm -hmm. to 
corporations in other countries, you know, uh, and often these are um, developing countries. Right. So real quick, uh, this may be tangential and you can totally go skip it, whatever. Um I read it and, and, and I, you mentioned like the import export bank and you're like, not the world bank that gives loans to other countries, but as you're talking developing countries and the stability of those countries. And I read a book years ago um, that I think has become pretty popular called confessions of an economic hitman. Did you ever read this? It was John Perkins. I haven't, and, I've heard about it though. And I'm... it's about giving loans to other countries so that they could like in debt them. They go, okay, we're going to give this money to you, Haiti. But you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to agree to these infrastructure things that we're going to put these roads in and this, that and the other in. But it was a way to gain control over power in other countries. Anyway, so probably tangential unless you're like, oh, no, no, no. Dad was all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't know exactly what is, you know. How much of that was, uh, you know, his level of. Sure. Of, well, that would be more of the kind of World Bank IMF stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. they're they're definitely involved in that. But yeah, it you know those kind of loans uh, come with more strings than your house mortgage does. <laughs> sure, 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 <laughs> sure. Okay, so that then takes you guys around the world because right. different gigs he's getting, different jobs, different governments he's going. So you live in so I live in a London. dozen different cities before you're uh, there in New York. Yeah. Yeah. So I, okay. I you know, started, I was born in, my family's all from the South. Uh, I was born in North Carolina. So I was called the Yankee cause it was North. Uh, <laughs> and then we lived in, you know, Philly, London, DC, um, Leningrad, Moscow. So, you know, a bunch of different places. Um, the majority of my childhood was spent, uh, broken up with a two year stint in, in London, but in the DC Metro area. Um, okay. My dad traveled a lot though for this work. And when yep. he wasn't traveling, he would often, you know, he he's one of these guys that sleeps a few hours a night. So really? he gets, yeah, he goes to sleep early, but he's up at like 3 a.m. So he goes, you know, four, I think he's, as he's getting, he's aging. He needs like maybe five hours now, but you know, so four, dad's still alive. He's still alive. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, uh, but he would, you know, he would be at work super late and he would come home and then he would go in his office and he'd be working late, close the door. So there was not a lot of, when he was around, wasn't very available, but that was what work looked like. It was. That is a, that is a formative input, right? Like you talked yeah. about, and you said, as you got into, let me say this about the family is like, dad shaped this a lot for me, but he was just grinding night and day. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. But not because, um, you know, he was working the night shift or a double shift, like some people have to do to make ends meet. This wasn't toil. This was like he loved it. an obsession, a vocation, a calling. Yeah. And it was a priority for him. Yeah. Maybe so even it's... over and against things that you wished would have been priorities. Oh, other than that, right. Yeah. hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. Yeah. No, we were, we were very much, uh, not first tier. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And that, so, that was a common story. A lot of our generation too, with like, uh, yeah. that was a model of the working man. Like, I mean, my dad, my dad wasn't as much that, but he was, he loved what he did and he was, you know, kind of obsessed with it and worked hard and worked early and worked late in the office, went to the office, but then at home had an office and was just like, he was in there. Yeah. And that's something as, as a dad now, who's an entrepreneur who works, you know, I grind and, I, I worry all the time mm. how much of my time am I giving and am I giving enough to my daughter? Now I know when she was younger, I had, I was not doing, was not starting a business and it was easier a little bit. Right. When you were uh, teaching. Yeah. When I was teaching yeah. um, and teaching is a great teaching college is a great gig. You know, I had two, days a week I'd had to go into the university. My classes were six hours long. So I would teach those two. Yes. Yeah, so they're long studio classes, but they're great. But the rest of the time I was time I was around, I was available. I would, you know, I was, I'm the, I was the cook of the house. So, and we all ate together. I was always taking my daughter to, to, you know, 
to school. And it, I, I was also a single parent for a large period of that, those young years. My, my wife, uh, Sadie's mom passed away when she was four, uh, from cancer. And so, you know, I was very aware of, you know, the time spent and that was, um, there was time lost from taking care of my wife being sick for many years. Um, so Sadie was 18 months old when my wife lost. All right, we'll just do this real quick. <laughs> in, in 2011, I was diagnosed with uh, stage three rectal cancer and uh, on Valentine's day. And nine days later, my wife was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. My God. And my daughter was 18 months old. So we you went nine days. Nine days later. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> uh, so it was, you know, it was a lot. And um, yeah. we went through, you know, fortunately, we were able to, I was presenting with symptoms and she was asymptomatic. So I went through my treatment, chemo and radiation and chemo and surgery and surgery first before she started to actually get sick. And she started, you know, so as she started her chemo and the cancer spread uh, ultimately spread to the, her spine and uh, then to her brain. So she passed away from brain cancer, but that, you know, we were able to trade it on and off. So there was one parent, you know, the first, my, my treatment took about a year. So I was really sick for like a year. Um, and then the next three years, my wife was really sick. So we traded off. So there was always a parent that was able to spend lots of time with Sadie. And we had, you know, an amazing community that rallied around us. Uh, I'm super grateful. I can't say enough wonderful things of, you know, it's, if you're going to go through cancer, go through cancer like we did. <laughs> it's, you know, uh, just so much love and support. Uh, and it's, it's tremendous. You know, it's, uh, but um, you know, after she passed away, being an only dad still teaching, though, at that job was great. Um, it gave me time. You know, I, she was in school at that point, which was made it a lot easier. So I would drop her off, go to the studio, paint, and then pick her back up from school and was home. And we'd just spend the rest of the time together. And so that was, you know, when she was little in formative years, I didn't have the kind of... Uh, guilt and trepidation I do at them currently, <laughs> you know, the, this past couple of years, which, uh, you know, uh, she's going, she's a teenager. So now it's another time where she needs me a ton too. I don't think there's ever a period of life <laughs> of a kid while they're growing up that they don't really need you. Mm. Um, I, does I think she, does she also, cause I remember being 13 and I would have loved folks to be a little more busy, right? <laughs> but she also wants you available. Uh, or is the 13 yeah. Is like, yeah, you need and want? Um, yeah, we have an unusually, uh, I, so I'm very fortunate that I, I remarried, uh, tomorrow's my wedding anniversary to your wedding anniversary. So that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Found a fun anniversary. Cool. Thank you. Um, and, uh, I'm very, very fortunate. Um, it, it, Sadie and I have a really close relationship, you know, understandably from, you know, the way our life unfolded, uh, her life unfolded. Yeah. So we spend and need more time together than I think probably most teenagers would want. I'm I'm waiting for the, the crushing day when she doesn't want to hang out with me. Awesome. And it's coming. I know it's coming. It's, 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 it's getting closer. <laughs> I can, I can feel it, but you know, she's 14 and it's, it's starting. Um, but for now, thankfully it's not, but yeah. And so, you feel, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to, you know, going back to your original question in terms of like uh, where that idea of work came yeah. from. Um, it was, I, you know, I think my dad plays the lion's share in my ideas and um, frustrations around it. So I have real issues with uh, work ethic towards myself. Um, I was never made to feel that I was a good worker by my dad. Mm. Uh, and that is something that um, still, you know, I've gone to therapy for years, which is I advisable. Have, everyone should. <laughs> yeah, it's advisable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at, at different times for different reasons. Um, and it's still something that, that, that plagues me is I have this 
I have a very hard time relaxing and not working and not feeling guilty about not working when I am. I mean, even momentarily. Hmm. Um, and that has, it's really hard for me to turn my brain off. I don't sleep great. Um, I get a little bit of my dad's not needing tons of sleep. I'm good with six hours, but you know, I wake up super early without an alarm clock because my brain's like, Hey, lazy, get out of bed. Yeah. What's, what's going on? Um, so it, it's been a drive for me at every job. And I've had probably over like 35 jobs um to just be re a relentless worker especially when it was for someone else um i actually find that easier <laughs> being my own boss uh has, is all and when you're an artist you're always your own boss as well so one of the the difficulties with being someone that has a hard time relaxing is any other job i had where i worked for somebody else I was cutting stone or making bagels or serving coffee waiting tables. When I go home, that's when I became boss of my time. And then I'd have to work. So I always had two jobs and mm -hmm. I was always just trying to buy more time for my second job from my first job's pay. And that's yep. how, it was. and, uh, any downtime was wasting that time I had bought. Yeah. And so yeah, I could, it makes sense how kind of the 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 both the example of dad and the like model of dad or input of dad, but then also coupled with the artist's journey in a way that is like you know I for years thought that's like I wanted to be an artist and I would get paid here and there for like I did photography for a little while and then I was a caricature artist at the theme park and then I you know I I. And then I got a bunch of jobs. I realized actually uh, that I was no, I had to learn business. I was like no good at actually getting paid. So there was a lot of things that I did where I was like, oh, it turns out people don't feel like they need to pay uh, for this stuff that I did already uh, for them on the side of their building or whatever. <laughs> and, and realized like, oh, contracts and things really matter. And so, um, you know, but like the 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 art life is a really uh like you said early on, it's, it's really hard to make lucrative in it, but you're right. It's like, you have, that is your vocation. Like you said, right in the beginning, you said, I never, like, I didn't even realize people decided what they were going to do. I knew from a young age, I wanted to be an artist, but probably most of your life, that's not what you were in terms of what paid the bills. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I started working. I mean, I started babysitting, you know, when I was like 11, and then as soon as I was legally able, 15 and three quarters uh, in D.C., you could start working. You could get a Social Security card and you were allowed to get a work permit and start working. It's three quarters. Really? They say three quarters. <laughs> you know, D.C., go figure. That's uh, amazing. I, I got a job at the Smithsonian. Uh, first, the, that was your first like oh, jobby job? Yeah, yeah. Wait till you hear how glamorous it was. It was uh, I was I mopped. The floors yeah at the author m sackler gallery of asian art and clean the fingerprints off of all the plexiglass because most things were in cases there because yep. it was yep. art mostly and every kid in the world just puts their face and and every morning that's all got to get cleaned by moi <laughs> <laughs> so that was awesome yeah. yeah and but it was also where i really started to learn that if you if you work hard good things can happen if you know i'm a i'm blessed with a couple of great gifts that i've been given in life one is artistic ability and one is being a a fairly gregarious person mm. outgoing and then being a hard worker mm -hmm. i definitely think that that's a gift as well um but combined you know gregarious and hard worker i soon was helping do the silk screening on the walls for the information so at the smithsonian the amount of waste is astronomical it's crazy they actually have a security guard who guards the dumpster because they throw away so much raw material Whoa. they don't going and taking it home it's crazy so for the this gallery for the author and sacro gallery there weren't labels i got stuck up on the wall they literally repainted every show redid the archways and the style of the Asian country that the art was coming from like out of Walnut and they had a whole carpenters 
room, wow. really craftsman. And uh, so they would silkscreen the text onto the walls next to the art. And so I learned how to silkscreen and started helping the guy who was silkscreening. And then, you know, I was really good at that. And then the, the lighting guy was like, can you help me do this? So I learned about lighting art and the candle watts and because everything had certain levels of luminosity that they were allowed to have, to have them on loan. So you'd have these screens and filters you'd have to put on and check the candle wattage by the object. And so I started working with the lighting guy. So I moved from mopping and cleaning the floors to silk screening the walls to lighting. And then, you know, I had done a lot of carpentry um, with my grandfather and my uncle and some of my dad just as like, you're going to help out. Um, so I knew my way around that kind of stuff. And I started helping out the carpenters and then the carpenters were like, this kid knows what he's doing and started, you know, started, became a, a carpenter's apprentice there at Smithsonian. So I, I worked there every summer and winter and spring break. I would go in and work any, you know, time I had off, they were super flexible with me, which was great since I was just sort of a floater helper. Mm -hmm. And all the guys made fun of me because I was a GS one government salary level one, which they were like, that exists. That's a, they were like GS 64. So I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was a GS one, which was $5 and 75 cents an hour. I think I left making almost like six ninety five over over those three years of work. You did that for three years. For three years, up until I graduated and went to college. Really? So okay, so this is like the first place you worked. Now, obviously, you worked other places in the interim, like different places, but you were there kind of on and off seasonally throughout the whole time until you went off to college. Yeah. And then, and because I was like trying to map this from this early childhood to this six hour interview that where you're going in to teach or whatever. And, and, and so college was a big chunk in there and you did a bunch of the TA. That's why you had a lot of the experience Were all of the jobs that you did like Smithsonian. As soon as you said that, started talking about, it, I'm like, it's adjacent to art. Like it's, it's in the world. It's in the vicinity. It's, it's related. I'm silk screening. I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning yeah, yeah. art. I'm carrying art. I'm, I'm designing something. Were all of the jobs like that or, or did you, like, I know for me, like I was like folding clothes <laughs> in the back of Ann Taylor loft yeah, so yeah. that I could go do this other work that I really felt called to. Cause not as an artist, this was a similar story for me working with the homeless or feeling called to like, you know, ministry or something like that. I was like, this is never going to pay. So you're, I'm going to lay tile. I'm going to fold clothes. I'm going to do this so that I can go do this. And it, that really resonates with me as well. Like something, cause I was like the thing I really want to do I'm going to starve to death. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I, you know, I had, <laughs> when I got to college, I was, um, I was very fortunate to be a TA, but that was start off just as like one class, um, uh, a semester. I, uh, mowed all the lawns. I was on the landscaping crew. I mowed okay. the lawns, picked up the trash. Um, and this is where I started to run into a really interesting predicament that came, um, and to play at a lot of other jobs, I was working too hard. I got was people got my my the there were I was the only student working on the landscaping crew. Everyone Wait, else, real quick, were there unions? There was uh, not a union for the landscape. Okay. So okay. just the only reason I'm asking, and I'll just share this real quick. I got called in. So a lot of unions will have like. Like the, you know, it was the stagehand union in particular. So a big concert comes to town. There's a huge show, huge setup. And I had friends that worked on the stagehand union. Well, a lot of times there's just too much to do. So they'll call, Hey, do you want to come? Well, you have to join the union. Like you sign some paperwork and you join for the day, but I'm not a union guy. Right. And I'm a hard worker and I'm excited about doing this new thing that once I get it, I'm like off to the races man, these dudes put me in my place and they were, okay. and it's, it, it like stuck with me forever. Cause I actually like, it put a bad taste in my mouth with unions because I was like, they're like, boy, we work slow. Like, like we do this forever. Yeah. You might be here for the day. You might be here for the weekend. We do this forever and we go slow. And I was just like, 
oh, I hate this. I hate this. But it sounds like you had, for different reasons, a similar kind of like, oh, these are old men. I'm the young buck out here. Yeah, same reason. They just weren't a union. They were they were lifers, though. You know, yep. they, was their career. Uh, and if you go in and you are, I mean, I just like to, like, if I had a job, I wanted to get it done. I wanted to do it well. I wanted to do right. it fast. I wanted to do it Me hard. Too. It's like, I don't need to sit around and be bored with a 30-minute lunch break. I'll finish my sandwich in 10 minutes. Let's get back out there and just knock this out and go yep. to the next. And that is not what people who are going to be doing this forever necessarily want to do. You know, it's the, it's the marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, it's a marathon. That's right. That's, that's exactly what it is. Yep. Mm-hmm. But I, I got told real quick. I had to, I had to cut it out. Yeah. That's <laughs> interesting. And, and no, no uncertain terms. Uh, and very similar. It stuck with me. Cause I was like, I don't even know what to, I've never been told something like that ever in my yeah. life. <laughs> I was, I was flabbered. Like I, I really was super clueless as to what like this conversation was going to be about. Yeah. And when it happened, I was like, it didn't, I was like, that doesn't, comp- what? Me neither. Yeah. I, it baffled I, me. Yeah. That does not compute. <laughs> that Especially is not- if you have that voice in your head being like, get up lazy. Like it's yeah. like, uh, <laughs> so y'all are just lazy. Oh, is this like a weak field of work? Like I was just like, what is wrong with y'all? Yeah. Yeah. It was very weird. Yeah. Interesting. So they, yeah. They had, and you know, you, you go in when you're, when they're doing the same thing on, you know, it's the groundskeeping crew. So they had the same job to do, you know, they do X through Z or uh, A through Z and then A through Z again. And they, and they had, it took A through Z took this much time, but if suddenly you have this one kid come in and their boss sees that you're on F and they're still on B, they're like, how come y'all ain't on F? <laughs> right. So it was, it was not just that they were unhappy about the pace. They were being shown Mm-hmm. That or what, could, yeah, no, that's exactly what it was. It was like, yeah. look, if you do this, then they know you can or we can, yep. then it'll become an expectation and yes. that'll make our life harder. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So that was that was interesting. But yeah, it was not, yeah. So I I did that. I worked at uh I tried to find jobs that I could do. Um I actually avoided intentionally for a long time creative jobs to pay the bills. Cause I didn't, didn't want to muddy that. I didn't want to spend my creative energy for someone else. I could do the manual labor mm. and do that and have my brain going on my own stuff, working in the background and then get home and be like, yeah, let's get this out. Let's paint this now. Cause I can spend all day on the mindless tasks that, that uh, we used to call it. I, I put, <laughs> I've had so many stupid jobs. It's amazing. I used to put uh well, I've cut stone uh, when I was, I lived out in Boulder, Colorado, when we cut uh, tile stone down to do sandblasting of uh, coasters. So you would etch an image into the, through a, one layer of this beautiful stone to a darker layer that was underneath using sandblasting it. And then you had to put little cork feet on the bottom of the, mm-hmm. these stones. So it was like, you know, you, you did a, all the way from cutting the stone up to sandblasting it, to polishing them, to putting feet. But, you know, you'd be putting, we called it monkey work because a train, a train monkey could come in and do what we were doing, but probably not as fast. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was, that was, you know, I didn't mind that. Like it was physically backbreaking, but it left my brain my creative. You know brain. what? That's interesting. I have very similar. This is really fascinating uh, for for different. But like, I never thought about it in that way. But like, wrapping meat at the supermarket was one of my favorite things I ever did. It was just like my. I mean, mindless. Like my brain did not even have to come to work. Right. Um, and yeah. I would be writing in my head, and I'd always have like a notepad on the like cutting board or whatever, where I'd be like jotting like creative work. Like it was like things were. Cause I just let my mind wander and it was like, Oh, my mind was just like picking it in. It was just in leisure, like, and you know, working on philosophy or thinking through things that I cared about so that later I could go get after it. Like I left with a plan cause my mind, but like my, my hands were just active. It was almost like a deep meditation, like just doing this kind of monotonous monkey work. 
yeah. um, allowed my brain to be free in a way that I actually remember like uh, fondly. Like, I'm like, this was really good work, like pays the bills, takes mm-hmm. nothing except attendance and muscle and muscle memory. Muscle memory. Yeah. You're on autopilot. It's, it's great. It is great. It's, great. it's you know, you, once you get in the flow, you know, there's those first few weeks where you're learning the, the systems and getting it down and, but then you go in and it's basically you, you're parking your body physically and allowing it to do that labor while your mind is off. I mean, for me, it was like playing movies. I'd be, you know, I'd get on the wet saw, except when it was like snowing. We had to have the, the gates open and the wet saws were all staying there because the sprayed tons of so water. You're soaking wet in freezing weather. <laughs> and snow would sometimes literally be snow because oh, it's, it's blowing in and we're we're cutting. And it's just that gets that gets a little you can't that pulls you back in the pain. <laughs> pain is like no that. One. Pain's great, man. It pulls you right back in. That's the pre- true. That's true. Pain makes you present. But if but if it wasn't those conditions, you could get in there and you'd go through a whole pallet and I, you know, a whole crate of stone and you cut that into these tiny little squares. And, you know, I'd just be watching a movie the whole time. Mm-hmm. The The jobs that I actually realized that I thought would be sort of similar that were not were the customer service jobs. I've had. Like I've worked at Starbucks. Starbucks was my first job out of, co- uh, out of college because mm-hmm. at the time they paid. Uh, they they gave you health insurance for 30 hours a week. Yeah. And I figured out that I could afford all my bills to work 31 hours. And that gave me more time to paint. Like every time I got promoted at jobs and I was always trying to get promoted at these stupid jobs because I was too hard a worker. I would either, if they tried to make me the manager, I would, that was like, it's time for me to leave. Yeah. And I would, I would quit. I can't, I can't have responsibilities. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, I've been here too long. <laughs> but yeah. I've been, Maybe manager has been here too long. I got to find something else. And if it wasn't that they made me manager and I got a raise, every raise I got, I decreased my hours. So I, like, I, I know what I need and I'm not, yeah. it's and not, I can yeah. now have more time. I just need my time. Yeah. So it's always about buying my time. Okay. So I got a couple questions that have emerged out of this little uh, journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of them, interestingly, you said like, I wasn't trying to expend my creative juices for employment so that I could go do that. Like I, that was for me. Um, and what it made me think of is I've, I've pondered for years and it's come up in some of these conversations on the work ethic is like the difference or the distinction between an amateur and a pro. Um, and typically when people hear that, they think one well, amateur is not good at the thing and a pro is good at the thing or better at the thing. And I have uh part of this is just out of etym like I'm a geek with like words and etymology. And so I was digging into like amateur is comes from, and I won't get this exact, but it's from like a, a more or a, like in an, it comes from love. So like the word amateur means for the love of, and this really resonates, I think with a lot of artists where it's like, I do this for the love of, and then professional really is to be paid for this thing so you can actually be like i remember working with a professional caricature artist that was quite terrible but they were a professional they they were paid to do it but they weren't good like you shouldn't have gone to them for your sketch you know they were a professional technically and then i've had this like almost this conviction where i'm like even if i get paid for this thing i always want to remain an amateur I want to remain, I want to remain in the place where I am doing it for the love of, and, and this is kind of, I'm, I'm hopefully the question is emerging here. You're kind of getting what I want you to speak to, but I want to illustrate because someone I talked to on here, they led, um, they, they, they played music for a church, like worship music. And it wasn't professional. It was like, they were just like a volunteer and they were a guitar player. But they were like, you know, it was like, and it reminds me of like an artist, like for the muse or like for, for the love of God, for like just the community and the love of God and beauty and goodness, like this music came out of me or whatever. And they did it forever. And they were like, this was a really important part of my life. It it was meaningful. It was identity shaping. I really, it was, you know, all these things. And then one day there was like a church that needed someone for an event and they offered to pay me. 
And he's like, I'd never been paid a dollar. Uh, but I was like, yeah, totally. I mean, like I play this music all the time. I know these songs, I guess you could pay me. And then he, and, and you can probably, I could probably go back and find this episode. I want to say it was John Sanders said, and then I got up and I immediately like, I was filled with uh, a kind of um, self-consciousness and like it was gone, like all of the passion was gone. And he's like, because now I felt, well, now you're getting paid. You better perform. You better do well. You better, you, 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 it's, it's, this is about the audience. He's like, I'd never even considered an audience ever, which actually seems like good advice for an artist. Like this isn't about like, this is between you and the, and the muse in some way. And then they, they're a byproduct that they can appreciate this and and it actually was this weird it it, it like na- it drove this point home for me where i was like oh he had he was telling a story of an amateur a love story and then he like prostituted it not to make it ugly but he was paid for the thing that always was an act of like love and all of a sudden he was like it was broken like i and it was just it wasn't like he thought a lot about it he's like all of a sudden i was a paid performer and I didn't think I deserved to be paid. I wasn't good enough to be paid. And it became performative. And I and he's like, I didn't do that great. It got really, it was like, it, it, it wasn't, it was no longer worship. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you, like when you said, I didn't want to be paid for the creative act. I wanted to save it for me. It reminded me of this thing I've been puzzling over about amateurs and professionals and like the conviction that like you should remain an amateur. And I would love to just invite you to like, speak into this oh yeah man that's it's <laughs> i think it's it's a topic i love actually to Good. talk about the relationship of a how how we think about art the creation of art and the and the marketing and the capitalism of art mm. and and the and the two should not be together to be honest in my opinion in my opinion. okay and it's it's you know, part of me started really wondering about this in college where there was a very distinct line drawn by the institution and by faculty between the painters and the illustrators. Now, I wanted to be a painter, but all the painting that was being taught at RISD at the time in the painting department was this non-representational abstraction. And that's not what I was interested in regardless of however you feel about it aesthetically was just not what I was interested in doing. I wanted to know how to paint representationally. I love the human form and figures and expression of that. And there were really great painters teaching in the illustration department. So I went to the illustration department and they, there was, there is this real war in the minds of between illustrators and painters. Um, that is, that's false. It's total bullshit. Mm-hmm. but they they want to make it that painters are, are artists because they're not doing it for the money and illustrators only do it when they're getting paid and that's sort of where they drew the line and i i think it's this is it's a false statement i mean Brain, not to yeah. Too, yeah too specific into that industry to talk about it, but you know i think you know illustrators is a, a collaborative journey and fine arts is oftentimes a, a, a singular journey so illustration that's, that's an interesting oh. distinction yeah that's right yeah. because this is like the pre graphic art teams like 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 when i was growing up um you know i i was an i was an artist man i was i'm good with a paintbrush and a pen i don't do it at all anymore by the way uh that's a whole other story for maybe another day but like i I would draw what I, so I would get books, like go to the library and get like books, but like you could get paintings and I could go try to paint, but there was nothing like those thick last year's illustrator, like just going through and like, look at like illustrator work was what taught me the most. I was like, these are technically sharp, but you're right. They were like, they were team products. They were related to some, like we're, this illustration for uh, a technical assembly of this like aircraft thing or whatever. And, and, but but to me, I was like, these are the most beautiful 
uh, pieces of art in a way, but th- I, I, I wasn't aware of this conversation you're talking about, but it makes sense to go. This one's the, the, for my, like, this is the amateur and this is the professional in the, in the, this dichotomy. But then to say like, one of these is like, there are very few paintings done as community. I mean, like the kids finger painting mural is the collaborative paintings I could think of. I mean, maybe there's others, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's been some, some, you know, contemporary modern artists that have done, you know, collaborative artworks and performance pieces or, you know, works that their, their intention is to explore the concept of collaboration. Um, but yeah, the, the, the idea of money, I think is what really mm-hmm. is the crux of it. And so this idea of being an artist and so we get it twisted, right? And it's it's yeah, really unfortunate. It's great. The idea of success. And this is actually something I, I spent a lot of time when I was teaching, talking to my students about is that the most important thing you can do for yourself as an artist is define success for yourself. Because if you allow the world to define success for you, you inevitably will be sad about that. Mm -hmm. Because you're living up to some other standard. And oftentimes in a capitalistic society, it's material, especially in art. That's the, the, the rarity of it that success is what we view success as you've got a show and you're in a big blue chip gallery and yeah. so yeah. many dollars and you just get to go to your studio and you, you paint all fucking day and that's success. Yep. And you know, that's not necessarily what success has to be or needs to be. Success can be getting to spend 10 minutes a day drawing. You know, you know that this is a question that I ask every single person on the show um, is how do you, how would you define success? And the fact that you're talking about this idea and that this is something you're driving home to students and saying, you need to define this for yourself. I just feel like just tease up so well. So like, (laughs) how do you define success? A, I, I find that I redefine it constantly. Mm-hmm. Sort of like I I I am a I'm someone that doesn't believe you should have beliefs. <laughs> this is interesting. Okay. Because uh beliefs are, I think, you know, get cemented. They they get hard, they become immovable. And they often lead to not questioning yourself and then that tends to bring about a fear of questioning at all and i think if you are afraid to question yourself first and foremost then you're no longer having a dialogue with the universe yeah you you've decided so beliefs become these immovable things for a lot of people and i think it's the 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 big friction of our society is that we have decided we've all decided on a lot of things because, and you know, our, the brain is lazy, you know, it it likes to have answers and boxes that things fit neatly in because we want to process and we want to be efficient. Uh, And it's interesting. This comes up in the conversation around AI now all the time too, is, Oh, well, you know, the definition of, of being able to, to tell when a student's, smart and doing well is going to go out the window because AI is going to be able to give them all the answers to everything. I was like, well, maybe our fucking definition of intelligence is not right to start with. Maybe we shouldn't be using all these Rubik's and in metrics that we are measuring on how well you can take a test. Those have been flawed and fucked already. Mm-hmm. So maybe AI is going to actually force us to not be lazy and rely on these systems that we make everyone try and fit into. And so therefore, maybe it's a really great thing. Maybe we actually have to start to really pay attention to individuals and figure out if they're fucking smart or not. And it's the same thing with success. I think that you have to, I I don't think I can give you a really good firm definition of what success is besides saying that if I feel like I am doing something that is fulfilling and fulfilling for the needs of others and myself simultaneously 
then that to me is a success. That's really good. Um, and, and it actually calls back to, and I don't have the note right in front of me, but you, as you just defined your work of shaping people as an educator, you actually, the fulfilling is the word that actually stood out to me. Like, I can't tell you how fulfilling it is to, <laughs> to help somebody to like find their way. And actually what's interesting. So it's just interesting how this ties in with the way that you're saying, like what success is for you. I love the idea of it being broad and changing and redefined. Um, it's interesting. So I want to like go back to this thing you said a little bit and just like, I'm going to do my best to muse on this. So like, I don't believe that you should have beliefs and they tend to become cemented. Um, and, and then you're like, we, because we don't like this, the, we want to, we want to have like axioms. We want to have like certainty. And so like, we're like, this is what is true. Like God is real and this is true. And this is true. And actually for me um, in the, in the arena of like philosophy and theology, this has actually been um, I feel like similar because that's an arena of beliefs. A lot of people would talk about beliefs and I would always contrast personally, and we don't have to get into this, but with beliefs and faith where I see yeah. like faith is like an ecstatic reaching beyond what I, understand like like just it's just out of reach it's ecstatic versus um a belief which is like under my control or something that i have rather than something that has me right something that has a grip on me is more how i experience one and that actually comes from an experience of suffering which i know you're familiar with but like the experience of suffering was one that something bigger than me is having its way with me and that actually was like related to that anyway i'll come back to this the belief that you should have beliefs um, and then you said that, you know, they tend to become cemented and it comes, it like will bring about an inability to question. And then even your own, I'll just point out, and you can rewind this later that your own language betrays you a little bit. Cause then sure. you go, you go, because I believe, I believe that we, and effectively this isn't a quote, but you like, you said, I believe that we should be open that there's. And so what I, what stood out to me, cause I actually want to affirm it completely what you're saying. And this is what I've called in like philosophical or theological language, like the, um, the wisdom of agnosticism where I'm like, you need to remain agnostic about these things that you do not know. And that actually is it. Cause at some level, I don't believe that we should have beliefs is a belief right you're like you circle back on yourself <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's like there there is no avoiding this but you're like currently i, I think this is what i believe in it and it is like you're what i hear you saying is i believe in something like a resolute openness to the strange other that is the future and the world and and the journey um and that that is a position of like a vulnerable relationship with it that that I remain in a dance with. So I can only say like now success right now looks like it's fulfilling, it's meaningful, it's good for the world, it's the people around me, myself. And that's about as good as I could tell you because it's like and I find that that doesn't always look the same in these different places because I'm on a journey because at one point you know, I'm, I'm happily married with a baby and then I'm desperately sick and then I'm a single father. And then I'm in, you know, it's like, I'm in these different places in life. And so something else is required of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and anyway, I don't know. So I want, I want you to say how I did with handing that back a little bit, but like, oh, perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Does that, does that kind of like sound about right? It, it, it does totally. And it is a little bit about, you know, the trick of language. It, it's right. There's no way around. But it also is just so it, it's a it's a constant be a constant desire to be open to reproving. Yes, but that is work. That is work. That is effort. And so I think you know there is an extent to which you can only be so open because otherwise you spend and maybe that's what monks get to do is just spend all the time constantly reproving something to themselves. Mm. But. I'm I'm open to that and to hearing and actually I mean I've found religion fascinating I, all my life I've read a translation of the Quran I lived out in Utah in Salt Lake City read the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's I've read the Bible studied it in my my 
distant my my relatives are from the south they're all southern baptist extremely religious i have some that are evangelical christians now unfortunately uh, <laughs> and, uh you know i i don't ever i and dis i don't think that religion is bad for people i think that it you know watching people deal with my my wife's death mm -hmm. around me and the comfort that it gave them the knowing that they had i was so envious of that mm. a lot because but for me i didn't i just can't i can't know because i i you know to follow the the logical course of things yep so i i had i'll, I'll tell you a story that kind of sums up a little bit of it I had um I had this I lived in I lived in Salt Lake City and I moved out there right after college because I had a roommate that told me it was awesome. And uh is it awesome? Apparently misery just loves company <laughs> and invites and invites it over. <laughs> Come, it's great over here. Uh but he was, you know, he was ski patrol and I was like, oh man, I love snowboarding. I was like, you only get to snowboard for free all the time. And so I was like, oh. and I had gone out there hiking and camping, but in southeastern Utah. So I was yeah. like, oh, it's beautiful. That's not Salt Lake City. <laughs> so I was out there and Mormonism was a thing. And Matt, my friend, uh, he knew how into religious studies and philosophy I was. And so he had met this guy, a friend of his, who was an up and comer in the Mormon church, a young guy. And uh, he was like, I want you to. I want to invite him over and I just want you to talk to him. I was like, man, I felt like an intervention setup, but so he came over and guy was, I mean, super nice guy, young, very Morm Mormon and nice are like, um, uh, <laughs> I think they're synonyms. Like, <laughs> in my not. experience, they're not, that's not true. I'm like, these that's... are the nicest people. <laughs> that's not always yeah. the case, huh? Well, on the surface. Okay. Like, well, fair enough. Fair enough. Of, that's yeah, all. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough bless your heart that you know the down yeah, yeah, south yeah, yeah. version that's the you know, <laughs> well it, it as distinct from kind let's say nice yeah. at the yes. as the, nice is a surface feature very very true yeah. very. this guy was this guy was kind too though but Good. so we, we had this we had this long talk about stuff and he was it came down to i i asked him how he knew with such certainty what it was and he told me about this experience he had and he was hiking and blah blah, blah and came down the stream and there were some things that happened and he's like and then and i knew that that was that was our savior my lord savior and blah 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 i said but how did you know who that was i said so i told him this and this is actually something i got from a uh, krishnamurti reading mm -hmm. um, if i ask you to find something for me but i don't tell you the name of it how can you find it? So he found Jesus because he had a foretelling in his mind mm -hmm. of that this experience would be called this. This is what we call this. Yeah. He puts that together. Mm -hmm. That's lab taking a label and adding it to an experience you've never had before. But if you're just open to saying, I had this experience. But our brains want to be able to label shit. We love having names for things. It's a drive. And it's necessary. You step out into the street and you turn right in New York City and there's something yellow coming at you, or used to be. You're, you didn't have time to go yellow, square, moving fast. Oh, cab. Now you're dead. Mm -hmm. But it's time you have to process that. Your brain needs to have these shortcuts, these prejudgments of what's happening as a survival mechanism. But- we have allowed our culture to supersede our biology and take kind of dominance of that. And so we have this, you know, need to name things because then how are you going to tell somebody else about it? You know, what's really fascinating about this thing that you're bringing out is it just, and this isn't just in Judaism. It's in lots of places, especially among mystics. Like they talk about the ineffability, the unsayability of the presence of God or whatever. But actually the, 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 the Hebrew scriptures have like this prohibition against the name. 
Like they actually called the the idea of God the name. Like that it was like like Hashem, like this thing we can't say. Like there's this unnameable presence or whatever. It's just really interesting. Like what you're the thing you're bringing out is like this idea of like giving it a name, and this very ancient idea of like don't try to name this. Right, in Islam, you don't you can't represent it. Don't right, show. don't 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 draw it. Yeah. Don't sculpt it. Yeah. Don't don't say it. <laughs> but then it gets caught up in the belief and those rules. Yeah, and, yeah, that's right. And it gets it gets twisted. We can't help ourselves. Yeah, it's it's just in we, us. We, yeah, yeah, that's right. Is it it is it is hard work to 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 be willing to believe without saying anything about it. Man, that's powerful. I uh so I'm I'm I'm. There's a, a couple places I want to go. Um, are you good on time? I still, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I, I know we're okay. getting close to when I said, but if you're okay, um, uh, this is this is great, man. I, I'm loving every second of this because I, yeah. I text my wife over here. I'm like, I'm gonna be a little later. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I wanted to um, as we're as we're talking about this, so there were some things that came up, and we've we've gone through lots of topics, but like this. So you talked a little bit about your own experience with cancer, um, the loss of your wife, the, um, your, your time as like wanting to, and it was just really interesting. Like the painting in college, that was being taught as non-representational. And then you ended up going over the illustrators that you kind of came to when I asked you about amateur professional, um, the collaborative nature of illustrators that really stood out to me. And, and, and then I'm like thinking about even now this, like, you know, we've gone to like the ultimate, like the, the thing that cannot be named, right. The ultimate in terms of the place that we find meaning and purpose. And like, and to me, that is a close relative of suffering and grief. Like that for me as a place where I was like, when you said, like, we talk about the, I think you were talking about the wet saw in the snow, but you're like pain makes you present. And I was like, actually, that is the the conviction that so much of my, let's say beliefs were built on because I didn't have to believe in it. Like, I'm like, this is the most real experience imaginable is excruciating pain and overwhelming grief. And I can, and when I say that no one on earth doesn't nod their head. Yes. Like everyone's like, yep, we all agree. And I'm like, good. Then that should be where we start. Like that's where we start. And whatever we say after that, it's like that we do know, like certainly pain is real. So I'll start there. Cause I have a, the the foundation there seems solid to me at, for humanity. So, okay. All of this trying to like take all this we've talked about. And I wanted to ask you when I, when I was looking at your website, uh, I believe it was on, um, and there's so much we didn't even get to, we're gonna have to do another one of these, but like, um, I wanted to ask you, you have a series of large scale oil painted portraits, um, under the, uh, it's called in their own words. And so on the, there was so much, even just reading the brief description and looking at the artwork, there was something about it that seems collaborative. There was something about it. And another series that's on your website as well, that talked about like kind of your own, but there's like this self reflection element of it. Can you, can you, sh- I, don't, I don't, I'm not asking you to tie this to what we're talking about, but for me, it just seems like it naturally leads into some of this, like really the, the artwork the fine art that you've kind of poured your, your, your heart into over the years. Um, and maybe both of these series, if you want to share, cause the other was the, the light of my, of the mind. Is that right? Know. And, and both of those seem to me to um, almost like, as you were talking through these other things, I kept like remembering what these works of art were like, man, there, there's, it, it feels like it's related or relevant. Um, and I don't know if you, you can maybe share a little bit about those those works yeah uh i'd be happy to you know there um <laughs> the i i think a lot about i i ended up you know painting people that was what i just loved doing i gravitated towards it you know you learn when you're learning traditional painting you paint still lives you paint landscapes you paint people and for me i i love psychology and it just had had all the elements i needed the human form are is an endless possibility yeah. textures and materials yeah. and 
form and structure so it can be molded into express all kinds of things and then you can add in you know two figures or you can add in you know shapes or you know so there's there there is a lot to be done in that space to dig deeper into yourself mm -hmm. the expression of others uh and then i get really really nerdy and heady about the idea of portraiture and what that is and how do you you know breathe new life into something that is one of the oldest forms of painting and so, and purposes of painting to represent another human being and so all my series have been uh finding ways to re-examine portraiture finding new ways of showing our commonality and our individuality at the same time and getting further and further of myself out of the way of that expression and you know i've done a whole series of the insides of mouths where there's these big six foot paintings that are just people's mouths which people were not super willing to open their mouths about but oh interesting to get the to wait get to take you, you had to use photographs there was yeah, yeah. no way you were like it like <laughs> yeah. like no this was, i was in uh i was in new york when i was doing this series and i, I was i had a digital camera because we didn't have cell phones back then and i was working from the i didn't have i couldn't afford the paper to print the pictures out on yeah uh so i would just work from the little uh two thumbnail by screen screen yeah stop it and i would make six foot paintings what the, yeah so i would shoot people's mouths and it was really fascinating because Everybody that I was was in earshot anytime I talked about this had a really intense story about their mouths. The inside of our mouths are this amazing space where if you take your tongue and you move it around, that space does not feel like the size it is. It feels big. The way we visualize and think of the inside of our mouths is not the size our mouth is. It is much bigger. Hmm. And so... By, and it's extremely personal. Everyone's, you know, we're identified by our dental records when nothing else fails. When everything else falls away, your teeth are a as unique as your fingerprints. Yeah. And so I was like, this is the ultimate sort of portraiture. And, you know, you can see someone's brushing habits there. Do they have periodontal disease? Do they have gingivitis? Have they broken their teeth? So many people. And I, I started this series because I had my two front teeth broken in half and an, I had another friend who was so poor he had to have this old vietnam vet guy take his molar out with a pocket knife and i had couldn't afford uh the very first one was actually i couldn't afford uh, to go to a dentist and i had uh impacted wisdom tooth so i went to the nyu dental school uh and you can have the students practice on you basically they're supposed oh yeah 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 and they, you know, it was like 70 bucks to have it taken out and they jacked it up. They mainly I, just do extractions, right? That's yeah, like, yeah. 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 But I, I, it was, I was laying there and my eyes were closed because it was not going well. It was like hurting and there was this all this cracking. And all of a sudden I heard this Whoa! and I opened my eyes and one of the students who had a face shield on was just covered in blood, like that just <laughs> shot out of my mouth. And they were like, uh, whoops. We need to hear it. And they started just packing gauze in my mouth. And they were apparently they had there's supposed to be a faculty there and there was not. So they had just been going full <laughs> no protection. It's a horror uh, story. Uh, they, they got they had to like go find someone in the library, a professor to come in and finish it off, like tooth broken in four people. So it was a really intense experience. And I would spend a lot of time I was looking at the inside of my mouth, watching this gnarly mess in the back of my mouth and i took a picture of it and that was the first painting i did from it was the inside and then i was like this is fascinating and fun and they became this that that scale shift i was talking about that happened when i did the painting because it was so big it looked like this bloody cavern mm -hmm. and i started taking you know i just uh, i went around i would get people to to pose and everyone had really intense experiences about their teeth Everyone hates going to the dentist for a reason. And so the paintings were, I mean, some people found them really violent looking. Some people found them really beautiful landscapes. People have very different reactions to them. So it was a great series. So anyway, so I went off on a tangent. Sorry about and those were six feet, four feet to six feet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Big. They're big. Amazing. <laughs> 
Um, so they, they, and they were fun. I'm a very physical painter. I like the movement in them. I like the, uh, you, there were lots of areas where you could be just loose and totally abstract and then figure out what parts had to be formal. Yeah. And the, you know, I always like paintings that give me a challenge that I'm not sure. I, I'm, I have a saying that if I'm not lost during a painting, I haven't made any progress. Mm. And then it was, was a waste of time. It was just an exercise. It's a good, so, yeah. So I, I, I would always try and find things. I was like, I don't know technically how I'm going to do X, Y, or Z in this painting. And I was like that when I had a series that presented a challenge that I was like, never done this before. I don't know. How are you going to get the difference between the feel of a gum that's on the side of a cheek that's red to the gum that's surrounding the teeth that's red to the tongue that's red to the top of the mouth to the palate that make them all feel like the, the, the type of flesh that they are all with such a limited palate. How are you going to get enamel? You know, so all these technical things, I was like, oh yeah, let's go find out, you know? And so that is what I'm always looking for in series. So with the, 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 uh, in your own words was sort of like the final removal of myself out of the, the the process. Everyone was shot with the same lighting in the same spot with uh, the same scale. They're all 1.2 uh, uh, scale to life size. So they're four feet by four feet. They're all the same size. And they all, if you stand four feet away from them, the actual all appear life size to that person's particular scale. And uh, I gave them, I interviewed every one of them for about two hours and had made up this false based on like the uh, Myers-Briggs test. It's a long series of questionnaires that they filled out ahead of time and they interviewed them about the questions. There were probably like 50 questions in it. There were only three that I was going to use as inputs into this structure. And it was, what color do you think you are? And earlier on, they were asked, what what's their favorite color? So that kind of took out their favorite color. And then later in the conversation, it was what color do you think feel you feel represents who you are the most? Mm. What shape do you feel represents who you are the most? And what single word do you feel expresses who you are the most? So the color would become the background of the painting. I would teach them the sign language for the word they picked. And that would be determined what the composition was. I had no control over what their hands were going to be doing. And I would shoot them and all the different poses. And so I was like, I don't know how I'm going to paint someone signing and get across the sense of temperous, temperance, temporariness of a moment of transition versus where it's solid, try and get across the sense of that they're actually saying something to the viewer. And the title of the painting is the single word that they were. So each of the paintings, that one word is being told to you. So they're self-determining all the factors. I let myself have one little caveat in that I could use the shape in any way I wanted to help balance out the composition since I had so little other artistic control over it. And, but I tried to, I would talk to them about why they picked the shape that they did and why the color. And I would try and use the composition and the element of the shape to express those other aspects of themselves that they were talking about and to get those all across. And so that's what that, that series was. Man, I'm I'm scrolling through some of these as as you're talking about it, and so ha, have uh, so you did you know sign la- like you know sign language? I had, I had had a a girlfriend uh, years ago that was deaf in one ear, and so she signed. So I knew some, um, and I've always been fascinated by hands. I love drawing and painting hands, and man, they're, they're always like on the body, right? <laughs> That's what everyone always says. Like, oh man, you can draw hands. I did a whole series of hands as part of my, so yeah. I've done nails, hands, feet, you know, and, uh, and then this, the full figure and, and of course, regular portraits. So I've done commission portraits, you know, when I had to pay the bills sometimes. Well, those- for those of you that are listening, definitely go to nathanbond.com and I'll put this in the um, link in the, I'll put the link in some show notes or something, which I don't do a lot of, but I'll put that down there. And uh Go scroll through these. Uh, I'm assu- so. It, have you had? I'm curious. So I don't know sign language, um, and I'm just curious. Like people that do. So if someone knows American Sign Language and they look at these, do they go? That's like without seeing the title of it. Like it. Have they been? It like do does it convey with it? Because it, oh. it is fairly obvious with the transitions. Mm-hmm. Like you did a really like I could tell they're like lighter, and then the stops are like solid. But if, if people looked at this, like, that's this word. 
Some, yeah. yeah. I think there, there's a couple of them that I think have been harder. Um, there's one that likes complex. Seven, the word complex <laughs> is just like a. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. 17 hands in that in that painting. Yeah, that one, that one is particularly interesting. And I actually was going to ask you if you, so it sounds like you remember these specifically. Like that one has a few colors in the background where yeah. like i noticed by the way that a lot of these tend toward like hot colors like they're we were asking it's like red blown away so many people picked orange orange like, red like they're yeah. they're that into the color wheel like across yeah. the board it looks like like if i don't know how many if this is all of them or whatever but but that's common how come this one is that's two colors yeah yeah i be because i i you know i spent a long time talking to people about what their answers were and why ah. these answers. So based on something she had said, maybe. So hers was that she, there. a lot of people have duality in them. Yeah. Hers was that she had this one color that she felt represented her as her exterior persona, but that she had this other one that was slowly trying to kind of break through a little bit. That's interesting. And so I tried to, as you see, it's kind of like, as it pans out to the side, you start to see more of it. A blend almost. Yeah. So that there's more of it peeking through, but she was, she could not say one. She would just not pick one, which was fine. I really tried to get people to kind of narrow it down, but her reason was, you know, I couldn't argue with her reason of why it was. Well, this, this one stood out as compelling as I like scrolled through. I'm like that one. I have quite like, I'm just interested in and, and I'm glad I asked. That's very, and there's one that has two shapes has a circle and a, inside of a triangle. And there was one that has um, that the person drew the shape and it's like a triangle with two with loops at the the three corners. Yep. And that was you know, the an, an, like an infinity, but a triangle. Now but it's all flipped upside down. It's very much her. She's very much about femininity and it's very much like the women's reproductive. You have the ovaries. Yeah. Vagina. So I tried to really do the best that I could to honor what they were trying to tell me about why they picked these shapes. And cause they were very diligent. And I mean, all the people um, were all people I knew from my life. Yeah. So not models that, you know, there were some that were friends that were recommended that I didn't know uh, very well, but I had met, but most of them are people that were very close to me and very, very close friends with. Now, did you end up doing any kind of like, I'm guessing these were shown somewhere. Yeah, they show in New York, and one's in the uh, New Britain Museum of American Art. So Currently, it's, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. In the permanent collection there, which is awesome. So it's so cool. the oldest museum of American art in the United States. How cool is in, that? Uh, it's in Connecticut. Did you do anything with these individuals once the art was produced? Like, were like I'm just I'm just interested in like them, like 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 late like after the fact like. You did the painting. I, I don't have my clothes on. Uh, it's 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 in this museum or it's displayed. Did you do any kind of like talk back with them or anything like? Oh, no, post wrap up. No, I mean, a lot of them were at the opening. OK, uh, New York, which was yep. really cool because some of them, you know, and I think more so for the women than the men, they're, they're very you know large and they're yeah. they're exposed. Yeah. And but they're all really powerful, strong women that I did paint um and were but they were like oh that's like yeah that's me they were like i'm not going to stand next to my painting during the show that's what, <laughs> like, mm. no that was sort of the yeah that's amazing that's so amazing so okay i'm gonna i'm gonna uh because i'm just watching the time and i'm gonna kick myself if we don't get to this at all uh i wanna so there there are a few of these like fine art collections up here and then we talked a little bit about kind of NFTs and the ways you're utilizing those for um, fair share publishing. Um, but you're kind of like OG project. Um, <laughs> I, I really want everyone to hear about. So um, can you tell us a bit about Sweet Baby Jeebus? Yeah, yeah. Sweet Baby Jeebus, which is my my Twitter handle still. Uh, so I, I go by a lot of people... I'm I'm not so in in the NFT space there were a lot of people who were doxxed or undoxed which means that your real name was not attached or it was attached and I've always had my real name attached but 
Um, People still call you the other thing though, right? So I'm like, hey, Johnny Produce. I'm like, oh, interesting. That's right. So you get called Jeebus a lot. Yeah, or Sweet Baby or SBK. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So like on on spaces on Twitter, um, people call me Sweet Baby Jeebus. Of course. Um, So yeah, which is which is really hilarious. So the the name comes from. So it was my way of learning and teaching myself about NFTs and how they worked. Yep. Generative collections which are were the big kind of trend and what most people unfortunately know uh, nfts buy from the media are things like the board api club mm-hmm. the generative collection is basically we have different traits that all fit on the same head so it's like a mr potato head right that's right yep done 10 million times or ten thousand times as the case can be right very it's- similarly like when i was drawing caricatures there was only so many mouths that we knew how to draw. And right. then when we, when we talked to you, we figured out which mouth you were, you know, yeah. as we were like putting it on. Right. But it's like, there, there's variation, a freckle here and there, but it's like, you know, there's many mouths, there's many noses and these generative collections, like to your point is like, this one might have sunglasses and this one might have a funny hat, but like there's the hat selection, the eye selection, the nose selection, and then they get randomized into the outputs, like yeah. the different features of the board apes. Absolutely. And yeah. a lot of these are done actually through a computer. So you make They're all the yep. things and then you put them in a computer and they throw them together. So as I was learning about all of what NFTs are, and of course I was really fascinated by the art, I was like, I had an idea to, you know, the best way to learn something is through doing. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to make a, a collection. And I, so I set about making a collection, but one that I found really interesting. So, which was to take, you know, a lot of the pop culture from my life growing up and art history. And, you know, I already told you religion has always been a fascination of mine and you can't go through art education and not be hit over the head constantly with iconic religious imagery i mean there was the renaissance for god's yeah. sake like you're yeah, yeah you're not there is you spend years looking at this christianity stuff. owned art for a season right yeah. like yeah yeah, yeah. well in, in what we get here in the united states what we get taught about it did not sure in, sure yeah. sure which is one of the the points of it as well but so i wanted to take you know kind of this contemporary icons that we grew up with and this the ideology of all of our consumerism and mash that together with the in a satirical, not not down putting, but but I think it's important to be able to laugh at a lot of the the dogma um, and also the the hierarchy of Western religious art and made sweet baby Jeebus. And so it is a little baby Jesus figure dressed up in uh, different poses. So there are three different poses that he was in that are based on some iconic works of religious painting from uh, the Western uh, pantheon of religious art mixed in with a lot of pop culture references like Atari and, you know, run DMC and things like that. It's so full of them. It's just (laughs) endlessly entertaining scrolling through. So, and I always, thank you. And I always loved, you know, growing up looking at picture books like Richard scary. I always wanted to find the worm. And Richard Scarry's "What Do People Do All Do All Day?" You know, one of my favorite books as a kid. So I, I so I love images that have stuff that you you get to chew on, that you you look at it and you you can absorb it. But then if you keep looking at it, you discover more things. And so I wanted those to have it. And so I ended up making seven hundred seventy seven of them. Um, I, I tried to make everything I did very important or have some relevance like it was minted on easter so he has risen (laughs) baby jesus has risen so the mint day was and i worked really hard to get it to be that specific day which yeah it's like oh if i don't figure out how to make this mint today i gotta wait what am i waiting for christmas (laughs) open c did an update in the middle of it and so i had to mint each one would mint five times then i had to go back and delete the other four and each one took you did these one at a time Yeah. And I didn't run it through a computer program because I wanted them to all look good. Yeah. So I made all the variables. I had my wife, who's an expert at Excel, create a spreadsheet of all the possible variables. And I used a Dungeon and Dice Dragon 
die to go through and start to select different. There were over 2 million. Use like a 20 side, 20 20 side side die. die. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I roll it for each one of the 777. It would get this attribute, this attribute, this attribute. But if it didn't look good, I would roll it again and pick another one. So they were still randomized. But I did that for all 777. But you, you kept like a uh, license. You're like, yeah, no, those yeah. don't go together. Yeah, yeah. Nah. Because was like, I'm not making something that looks crappy. Of course. I want it all to be good. Yep. So um, it's amazing how fast, you know, you can get into the millions of variable possible combinations. With it just- teaches you a lot about like exponential. Oh. Yeah. Like it's yes, crazy, yes. right? Yeah. So that's, that's what uh, Sweet Baby Jeebus was. And it was, you know, I had, I, I sold them. I had it set up I had a little website for them and they're not meant to be like, as you know, they're going to have a utility by the way, eventually, but no one knows that, but so they've already, on. they've already yielded some, some perks other than just having like, I mean, I am in love with this as a piece of art, but also like homie sent me a mug with, with my sweet baby Jeebus on it that I drink coffee out of just about every morning, except when I left something in it and it's nasty. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and 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 then yeah, uh, future surprise utility that we will we will that's hear right. about. And, and well. no, there are none for sale. The delisted all. So everyone that's bought one has bought one. So now people, they're not going to be any more for sale. So I have a, I have a lot of a lot of them under control, but then there are a good amount out there. Yep. That are back, and the, they are one day going to be. Just hang on to. It. You'll, you'll hang be on to it. I did notice, yeah, that there were none of them for sale anymore. Which that's that's uh, this is. Ex- intriguing and exciting and also i'm like you missed your window d- dummy um <laughs> so okay you another one. so <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. so you ge- you generated the l- you made the list of all of these attributes because you were talking at the beginning here about the generative by the way that's how i did the jolly rogers is i made the skulls with an 813 but there was a selection of what i called swords but some of those swords are like shovels or microphones or whatever underneath their their tools builder tools right right and then there were like different skulls that would go with those different tools and so um that was a generative collection so you input all of these things into like a a machine effectively like it's a program that and you say all right i want a hundred with this kind of variability and like you know this certain feature should be rare um like so like in those are all black backgrounds but there's red ones and the red ones are rare more rare because you just told it that it, the outcome will equal this and then it spits them out i mean in a minute i had a folder with all 100 of them like here they are um the, all the work went in ahead of time right but you made this Excel sheet. You sit there with your, with your D and D dice, which I'm, I'm like in love with this story genuinely. Like this is so much better of a story. You roll all these dice, you, you, you pull up your wife's Excel sheet or whatever. And you're like looking at what, what you have here. Um, you, you maintain some artistic control, but then. So like, let's just, I'm going to randomly open one here. Let's say 118. You don't know them by heart, right? So oh. 118, <laughs> there's 777 of them. One eight, Cause I was like, you did that with the other ones. What are we doing here? So uh, 118 is called the good shepherd. And um, this uh, baby Jeebus is in like kind of an Indiana Jones hat and has like the whip down on his side is standing in front of the pearly gates. Um, is holding swaddling a baby devil um and has big wide open eyes and kind of a face like a almost a surprise face the clouds in front of the pearly gates and like a halo over the indiana jones hat i love all of these okay so so one so you get your list and it tells you here's the attributes it's going to be swaddling Baby Jesus swaddling a baby, a even smaller baby devil wearing Indiana Jones stuff standing in front of the pearly gates. You're like, all right, cool. But then you what? You you one by one actually drew these. Yeah. Well, I so like I made I made some of the attributes so that I so like the baby Jeebuses were all there. The, the, were, the base, the base figure. Base facility, yeah. So my, my potato for my potato head was all yep. there. Yep. Then you draw all the everything else all separate. So then you can bring it in and add it in. But they all have to fit together. So they all have to be formed to fit on your so you have your backgrounds and you have your 
your yeah. gear. So you have all these different uh, folders of assets. These are the hats. These are the halos. There's and what's what I love about it is there's not even all the attributes are listed. So like all the irises are all different. Which if you could zoom in on the eyes far enough, but OpenSea would allow the file size to be there. Some of those have like the the irises are made up of writing. What <laughs> so, so the irises are really true. So there are like 20 different irises that each one could possibly have. There are nine different skin tones. There were, you know, so there were all these different things that are not listed. And I, you know, for selling them, like I wouldn't allow it to be searchable by skin tone because I didn't want anybody to be like, I only want a white baby. I was like, you're gonna get what you're gonna get. Jeebus could be anything. This Jeebus so, is black. Yes, I didn't say that. This is a okay. black Jeebus. So yeah, so you know there were there are a lot there's some of the attributes that are listed and some that are not. So there's actually a lot more attributes that went into it. So much than, more than you than you actually would have the list on. But yeah, I mean each each one of those things has you know um, a balancing to to another component, if that makes sense. So they yeah. they 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 work in in ways that uh, so. There were, there were three main poses. There was the teacher, the good shepherd, and um, oh, communion. Wow. Communion, yeah. And so that, so there was, there was, you know, all the assets. So there was actually like three projects in one, which was just stupid. I made this a lot harder than I should have, but it was, it was fun. It um, is an intricate project. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and like, this is part of like what all, why I want to like extract the like hard, by the way, this one has little, my little ponies, like in the corner of it. Um, um the, the, they're the by the way, they're the four horsemen. They're the four, <laughs> they're the four ponies of the apocalypse. They're the four ponies so, of the apocalypse. I don't know if you, the yeah, little, it's a pale horse with a little crown on its butt. Yeah. So each pony, my little ponies all had tattoos. They had, uh, beauty marks that were tattoos this one the has a reaper sickle oh my god i so yeah, like this four, is so good for the four ponies of the apocalypse and by the way this one has it says i'm with stupid and then the finger is pointing in every single direction <laughs> <laughs> oh i love this okay so so one, and one I, horn you know the uh hell hellboy yeah that's why the little baby has one horn sawn off it's a hellboy reference um man <laughs> there's so so this because you made this so intricate so clearly difficult and then also like even like right now they're delisted they're like you, you know um you you this was so like back to the like labor of love conversation yeah, you're yeah. like look i was trying to learn something i was doing something for me my this it was creative and compelling and meaningful to me this was clearly never some big commercial project. And yet uh, I got plans for this thing still, right? Like, like, like now you're like, yeah, like this, I'm going to somehow roll this in to these other projects. Like this may very likely, I would imagine there should be some children's books that, you know, I'm looking at some of these like teachers holding the D is for Doge and like that, you know what I mean? There's like, uh, I could see this uh, coming to fruition a little bit, even with other projects you have going on. And like, I, I, it's just so compelling though, to think like all of this labor, all of this work, all of these like man hours of spinning, rolling dice and, and sketching these things out. That is just, uh, yeah, it's just a little, little project I did this, uh, that it was, I, I was losing my mind at the end. I mean, I, I didn't, because of my <laughs> self-imposed deadline, I was, I was Easter. Seeking, yeah. Because so, I have so to have the, it so the, no, here's what's so good about that. I so, don't do about it, but it had so, to be Easter. <laughs> what do you call the 40 days before Lent or before I gave it away before Easter <laughs> is Lent, which is a time of suffering, fasting, and remembering death? I didn't even think of that. That's yeah, and you were just in the desert. I was in Lent, I was Lenting, you were Lenting it up, <laughs> I Lent it all the way to, to Easter. Yeah, I would yeah. imagine for you now, Lent and Easter. For all, it's alternative reasons entirely from the liturgical calendar or history are deeply spiritual and meaningful times. <laughs> it is. I, I bust out a little Jeebus. And <laughs> what's, what's, what's great is, you know, the project had like these next levels. If it was able to be sold out and I could buy time to make, afford time to take the break from my other jobs to yeah. do it. I had so many great fun things to to do with them. I was, I was making... 
Uh, well, anyway, that's too long. Well, I'll tell you, we'll talk about that another time. There's... I do want to do another one of these because I'm, I'm just like, literally like I could go down so many, I love talking to you. I want to hang out with you more anyway. And if this is a good excuse to do Same. it, uh, maybe, maybe this just becomes the, the John and Nathan show. Maybe we just, we just <laughs> do it up, but, but I do, uh, have a wife and I do want to wrap here before long. I am super grateful for you taking this time. Um, I do want to leave a window here for you to make any kind of like, tell people where they can find you ways they can support you, where they should be paying attention for the books coming out. Uh, anything you want to ask of people or encouraging people like have, have it take the floor here, um, before we, before we wrap. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I agree. It's been just awesome getting to talk to you and enjoy this conversation and your super insightful questions. I mean, it's what I love about the podcast in general and all listening to the other, other ones is, is just how good you are at listening. I do scribble a lot of notes while you talk. I know, but I'm looking down most of the time, but, <laughs> but, but you, you catch, you're, you're able to catch, I think critical moments. And that's what I've noticed in the past. And that's what it felt like today. So I, I thank you for, for being that kind of interviewer and, and asking. It, help, it helps to be genuinely just interested. Like just in the same way, you're like, I'm doing this. I'm doing this for me. You know what I mean? Like me, hopefully people enjoy listening to this show. It sounds like some people do, but like, I, I am genuinely curious about the human relationship to work uh, beyond, voc beyond employment. And, and I think an artist actually is one of the key figures that needs to be highlighted in this. And I think artist athlete, like there's some specific things that I think like maybe really well illustrate the like central place of vocation in our lives that I think is just so important. Like we're, we're built to build something. I think I believe, yeah, yeah. even though I know you don't think I should believe something, but I, I think <laughs> maybe that's innate yeah, that's and, and instilled. Um, but I, but that's, I, if, if any of this works, I think it's just, it's, it's an, just like the dude playing worship. Cause no one was paying him. It's like, I'm here for me. I'm here. Cause I'm captured by the muse or whatever. And, uh, and so you, 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 hopefully that, that, that is what makes it work. And I do think if it was like, well, you just paid me to interview you to get word out about your project. I imagine I would have had a similar experience like my boy, John standing on that stage going oh now I'm just self-conscious and performing and. Um, this is never that. Yeah. Well, I'll say this, you know, it's, it is, it's fair share publishing. We're going to have books out. I'm looking, I'm, we're looking for more content. You know, we want to write stories, uh, publish stories that are, um, they don't all have to be serious, but, uh, cause you know, some of the books, the, one of the first books is not about a serious subject, but we are very conscious about being a diverse company about, sharing diverse voices about hiring our partners that we hire being diverse and responsible companies themselves. Um, so if uh, there are writers out there and creators out there, uh, go to fair share publishing and they can find the submission page. There's a place and, for submission there. Yeah. They can submit the, their, their pitch or their manuscript. And um, I review everything. Um, so uh that would be what the one ask. The other thing I would say um, is I'm, I, I, I will ask something for um, a different group that I'm a part of. So I sit on the board of directors for a nonprofit organization called um, Comprehensive Youth Development here in New York City. And it works with, uh, they're called day night schools. So there's three high schools in New York City that serve students that would otherwise be left out. A lot of very large immigrant po population um, who are coming in, who have aged out or who have to work jobs. And so there's uh, one of the schools has flexible schedules and, you know, it, they provide, so comprehensive development provides a lot of really important services. They provide financial funding, but they also put in and support counselors lawyers to help with green uh, visas and, and um, residency issues, uh, job placement. They work with the city a lot to make sure that the students are graduating. They have a really high percent of uh, graduation rate. It's a really amazing organization. Um, and they are always in need of funds though. Mm -hmm. Two big fundraisers a year. I used uh, in the NFT community to do a fundraiser where I gave away a lot of my NFTs that I owned as part of a uh, a raffle for donating. 
through on Twitter. Uh, we'll do that again. That's in the spring and it all goes towards the spelling bee. They have a student spelling bee. So uh, it's, which is really awesome. That's sort of like the big, a big fundraiser event. And then towards the end of this year, though, we also have a big ask uh, where we try and reach out and ask people to donate to meet the end of the year financial you know, gaps that are that are in the system. Yep. But the school system just doesn't have the money to do. We fill those gaps. Uh, all the money goes to to that. It's an amazing organization. So it's comprehensive youth development, CYD. Um, so if people want to do something positive, uh, listening to me, I would say go check them out. If you can't support, support, but also we're in an attention economy. So maybe just uh, share that. They're on LinkedIn, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they're everywhere out there. So that would be what I would say. I love that, man. I'm so glad. You, thank you for uh, taking the opportunity as it presented itself to, to do that for them. I mean, I run a nonprofit, have a board of directors. And if, if I knew that the board of directors was out there taking these moments, uh, I would be delighted, elated. And so good work as uh holding up your kind of like role as a board member but also it's clearly like a deep um a deep conviction of yours so thank you for sharing about that i want to back to the other ask for content i wanted to ask a clarifying question really for myself because of someone i have in mind yeah. um i i may have mentioned this to you briefly already uh before off off of here but um i do know somebody that um has illustrated children's books that are uh, they have a, a handful of them they're being designed for uh, this is a, a man actually someone that's been on the podcast uh, named Prabha um, I will not be it, long Indian last name uh, sound on or something I will not be able to pronounce it correctly but you can listen to that episode uh, but he has a um, some characters that he's developed he has this thing called Bunda books that he created that um, anyway the question I actually have is around um, his are designed for educational purposes. So he, his story is one of like dyslexia and really struggling to learn and having all these learning disabilities. And he's found that uh, with his own children and a lot of these children that are getting like really left behind, it's actually, there's uh, problems around learning styles. Um, and he growing up in India, he's like, there wasn't even color books. He's like, when I got to Canada, which is where he ended up kind of when he moved from India um, he's like, it, just having color, glossy pages with color, all of a sudden, like captured something in me and I could hold my attention more or like pictures or like, he's just like the quality of these things. And so anyway, I'm just curious, um, are you guys open to educational material or things that are around like development? Cause I'm, I immediately want to have him submit or connect you guys, even if there's not some like opportunity for him with you. Um, I do think you guys would love each other and I want to make that connection. Just kind of two people in this arena. That's, that's who I know in this arena. Yeah. I, I would be more than happy to, I mean, definitely. It, it depends on like, are are they strictly academic kind of education or are they more story based? They're, sto they're, they're completely story based. Like it's each book but, has like a little. Pro so basically there's the character is forgetful and they'll go somewhere uh, the main characters, these three characters, they say they go on like a trip, but like they forgot the flashlight. And gotcha. there's always some problem and then they have to solve the problem. And it invites, there's usually like a, a project that goes with the book where like this, you'll, you kind of learn about yeah. like, like, so this one, if I remember right, they like capture, they learn about hydroelectricity because the, they can utilize the stream to generate current, whatever it was, or fire. I forget which one this book was. Cause I've read like a bunch of them uh, and I don't know which project goes to which thing, but they're crazy. They, so they learn about these amazing, like real world solutions, but they're always based on, it's a story, but the story is always like catalyzed by like, oops, I forgot this really important thing that we need to get by out here. And then yeah. it's like they, these friends put their heads together to like solve a problem. Oh, totally. I mean, one of the things that actually there's, there's a lot about fair share we haven't had a chance to talk about, but we create back matter, which is an educational component to all of the books that we do. So even I, I'm a big believer in that there's ways that you can take things that are not, don't have a specific bent, a fictional story and use those somehow in a classroom. So back matter is uh, basically projects laid out for teachers. So they can take the book 
share the book. Kids are interested and invested in the character. And there's a box that they can do. That's what they do. That's what this right is. Yeah. yeah. So they we have, have like a box, like we can assemble one. Yeah. So it's, we don't, we don't have like assembly things, but yeah. we have the, the content available for teachers to go and to be able to use digitally. Cause we're trying to a, be a greener company. Yep. Yep. We also print in the United States and our printer is also then, so we do traditional offset printing. So we do the big runs, like 10,000, 20,000 books. We are partnered with a really unique printer. Uh, and this was important to us too. Uh, so typically a book is printed in either China or India. It takes a boat to the LA port, which you have to drive 8 million miles in a car to equal the carbon emission yeah. output of that one boat ride. And then from there, it goes to a warehouse. From the warehouse, it goes on another truck to a distributor. From the distributor, it goes to the bookstore. And then you got to drive to the bookstore and pick it up and drive home. And then the bookstore sends half of them back. Yeah. And then it gets shipped back. <laughs> right. So our printer uh, started off as a, a tech company. So they they have API that back ends to our ordering system. So when they've already printed the books and then they house them on the other side of the warehouse. So they just get moved over by mm-hmm. by manual force <laughs> you like know pallet jack <laughs> pallet jack yep. yeah. and then they stay there and then they get packed and shipped from there to your house so they literally don't go anywhere and also being printed in the united states they have to meet mm-hmm. the uh, the forestry uh governance and so there our paper is more expensive our ink's more expensive but it's all sourced in ethical and ecological ways um so our cost of producing the books is a little bit higher but we we're trying to look at every aspect if we're building a new company with everything that we know, how do we build it exactly like I would want it to be built? Like a company that I would feel good every step of the way, as much as possible, buying something from. And so having an educational component to it was something I wanted to do from the very start as well. So we have um, our we have an educational specialist who's uh, the master's degree in education, is a teacher uh, as well, uh, who did back matter for Disney. So great pedigree, really, really brilliant woman. Uh, and so she's doing our back matter where we sit down and we talk about the lessons that can be gleaned from this and what kind of projects can be made for classrooms, what ages they can be used for, and then create that. And that content is all there. We have some for parents at home Mm. and then we have some for teachers. So like the teacher can go, but it's accessible to everybody and it's all free. That's not, that's all just all the additive stuff, which is what I love about it, is all there for the price of the single book. I love it, man. And the metaverse part is all free for anyone that wants to go into it. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to have a book to go into it. So um, there's a there's a, a big component of, of giving back uh, built into every book that we do. So, I mean, this idea sounds great. So yeah, I would definitely love to be put in touch with it. Well, I'm, I am going to connect you guys, even if it's just to be a friendship connection. And then, um, I'm curious now that we're back on the business, um, are you fully capitalized? Like if, it, cause like, as I'm hearing this and I'm going, man, somebody listening might be like, yo, I, I want it. This is going places. I wish I had funds to invest. Right. I don't. But that isn't to say I don't have friends that listen that do. Is is there opportunity? Could someone get in touch with you, or are you like you you're capitalized, you're good, or you're not looking for investors, or like where are you at with that? Oh, that's a tricky question. So I mean, we for each book there will be those NFTs. So we will be looking. So ah. one, one of the things I I wanted to do was to have this idea of profit sharing in a way. So the producers, the entry level is fairly low, but we cap it at 40 because we do want to have a support structure of people that like the book. So it's invitation only because I already, you know, anybody that wants to ask can come into it. Anybody that has this sweet baby Jeebus can automatically also get first dibs, first right of refusal to buy into it as well to buy. And so they're, they're not technically NFTs, they're NTTs. They're not transferable. Oh, Okay. Yeah. So once you buy and you can't trade them around. So we're trying to avoid being of security um, and doing our due diligence. Smart, smart, smart. As as much as possible. So it's um, the the price point to get in is low and the break even on when you come out back out is about five to 6,000 books sold, which is very, very low threshold. And then you're in the green. Um, And we wanted to do that to be able to create the possibility of sharing revenue for a larger pool of people 
that get locked that out. That is well, that's very interesting. So it is maybe so we we'll talk we'll talk soon then. It is so like, for, it sounds like maybe start, maybe we yeah. could get in. Yeah. To and in a micro level, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. To start in terms of how it's being funded, it's being funded through all of my life savings. <laughs> Basically. You're like, I'm all in on this. There's all my I have 18 jobs now. <laughs> and I don't get paid for any of them yet. Um, but we're, we're very confident that a no one's no one has done anything like this in the in the publishing industry. It sounds very That's innovative. Very exciting to me. It's a lot of things at once and a lot of components at once, but the technology allows for it. Yeah. We want to stay nimble. We want to stay not answerable to a committee so that we can make decisions that are not based on greed, that are not based on profit. Well, that's a good reason to avoid some of the big money capital that would take yeah. control or get too much of a seat at the table in a way. Yeah. So we've avoided that. And hopefully, you know, uh, if we can, if we sell enough of our books, you know, our business model is set up that that then becomes self-sustaining. You know, I'm never going to be a multi-billionaire off of this, but that's not, I don't need that for me. That's not success. Right. Yep. And if there are, I, I hope twofold, one that I can do this and be able to get more money into the pockets of the creators. Cause I believe if you're paying creators a living wage, a better than living wage, they can spend time making the next great thing. Mm -hmm. And how many great things have we I mean, They don't have to be off cutting stone or making coasters. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how many wonderful masterpieces or brilliant surgeons or astrophysicists have we lost because of capitalism? Yeah, weight of capitalism. So if we can have a company that functions in the capitalist structure, but its goal is not to line the pockets of everyone except for the creators, then then I I I think that that can a do two things. My my big hope is that it can cause the industry to have to shift some. You know, a tugboat can move these big tankers. And I just want Fair Share to be that tugboat that starts to push these big tankers to have to say, oh, we can pay more because this little company is doing it. Mm -hmm. We have to look at how we can do that because now everyone. Like, Boy, don't work so fast. Yeah. Slow down. That's not how we do things. We're going to work fast and hard. Here. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to get paid for it. You know, the last episode of this uh, podcast that was up is Ashley Karen, who is, um, I also know through the V friends community. She is, I don't know like, if you haven't listened yet, but it'd be worth listening to, but she, um, she's in Trinidad and um, we, so because of my work, which you're familiar with, and then her, I know her, she's one of the sorcerer scholars with the, with the scholarship program with um, Gary V. And I interviewed her and we've, her and I have been really building a relationship and geeking out around kind of a shared love of this like social enterprise, like really taking business and like leveraging kind of market for the impact in the world that we're hoping to see. And I'm, I don't know if you utilize that language or lens at all, but by the way, cause this week, since we put that podcast up, I've been like talking to her about how much I enjoyed the, the conversation and saying hey we should her and i we should like start interviewing social entrepreneurs um around like just like as a way to kind of meet and broaden things but like as as you're like the the last few moments of what you were saying is just like this isn't about being a billionaire we want to make impact in the industry we want to like pay better than living wage we want to like it's like societal kind of goals and goodness and it's just like you whether you know it or not, this is entirely a social enterprise. Like in that, the it's like, I have a bottom line. Sure. I have bills to pay, but that's peripheral or secondary, or at least adjacent to other bottom lines that really matter to me that we'll pull out of. If they don't, you have like ecological goals and human impact goals and then like industry impact goals. And it's just really, if you don't already know that it's a lens worth thinking about, but like, by the way, well done in terms of like d figuring out a way to leverage the existing kind of structure and capitalism and marketplace to create the kinds of economy and the kind of world that we want to see. It's like, whether you would ever put that on your like LinkedIn profile, social entrepreneur, I don't think you should start <laughs> doing that. You're artist and creator. But at the same time, I would say like, you would be like top of my list of people. If her and I ever said, we're going to do that, 
of someone we would want to talk to for, for exactly as you started articulating those, the reasons I'm like, there's so much about what you're talking about is this business is actually like a mission driven enterprise in a really deep way. And then, Oh yeah, it's got to sustain itself. Duh. Like, of course. I mean, th thank you for that. I had not thought about calling myself that uh, or yeah, I, I, I would mixed feeling. I would feel weird about it. I think. Um, well, and I don't, it, that's just an identity thing. Who cares? Like that's, I'm joking yeah. about the, like, put that thing. I actually think who cares, but I would, I would be, I would, I would totally be down to have, uh, do another interview and, and conversation. I would love that. And, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a great concept. I would love to listen to that podcast too. So yeah, I'm trying to talk her into it, man. She's, she, she'd be a good one for it. So I don't know that I've got a bunch of extra bandwidth floating around, but, uh, you know, <laughs> what? So <laughs> Sometimes I'm so not busy. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of bandwidth, man, I do got to wrap. Um, thank you yeah. so much for this time. Uh, I'm I'm super grateful for all your work, and we will be uh, chatting again soon. So thank you, dude. Absolutely, brother. I appreciate it too, man. Yes, sir.